Yeah. It just started. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. So you're affiliated with us, not. Okay. We call the meeting to order. Please yeah. ask for the pledge. Oh. oh. <laughs> Sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. We call the meeting to order. Yeah, roll call. Mr. Carson. Here. Dr. Fike. Mrs. Love. Mr. Polakoski. Here. Mrs. Raymond. Here. Mrs. Rhodes. Here. Mrs. Heather Smith. Here. Mrs. Kristen Smith. Here. Mrs. Williams here. Mr. Carson, Mrs. Love here. did call to say she would not be here this evening. Mrs. Love, I just wanted to announce that we were in executive session prior to the meeting for Mrs. personal Raymond, matters. Mrs. Rhodes, Mrs. Heather Smith, Kristen Smith, Mrs. Williams here. Mrs. Love did call to say she would not be here this evening. Do we have any citizens' comments? We do. Uh, Gina Miller. We do. Uh, Gina Miller. district has paid roughly $500,000 to a program for cyber and virtual learning. You have already proven a successful virtual cyber program K through eight. Stop offering it nine through 12. You add that together, that is a $2,250,000 and with a roughly overhang of $350,000. And there is roughly over $2 million in our reserve. Stop micromanaging this district. Get these teachers their contracts, get them their pay steps, get them what they've worked for, what they've earned, and most importantly, what they deserve. After looking into the financials, I roughly found almost $20,000 spent to a law firm called Campbell Durant. 
Why is the public not aware of this? Why is the public not aware of an anti-union, anti-public education law firm handling these negotiations? Why are my tax dollars paying for a law firm that does not support unions? The public, the teachers, and most importantly, these students have a right to know. I hope the teachers today are listening to this, and I hope there are many students listening in on this. The way you guys have micromanaged this district and the way you're handling my children's educators is down right wrong. These teachers wipe their noses. These teachers pick up the pieces of these kids when their parents aren't able to. These teachers email, they call, they reach out to parents and you're considering letting some of them go, furloughing them if you can't fix your $1.9 million dollar deficit when the money is there. Furloughing and letting go teachers should be the last resort, the last resort. If you are okay with this, then you are part of the problem. Thank you, your time Thank is you. up. Nicole O'Rear. There was a text that I got that said that there's a huge echo. We have the board meeting. I don't know if it's been can be fixed with that or not. They said they can't hear anything on that. Are you all hearing that upstairs that they can't hear online that there's an echo? Is, is is, is, I don't know if you're speaking. Hello? Is the podium microphone on? Oh, yeah. little. <clears throat> I think safe to speak about the past. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I can speak. Well. Yeah. Anyways, I'm Nicola Rear. Um, I live at 1155 Valley View Drive in Spotdale. Um, I rewatched the board meeting. I rewatched the board meetings all day today. And this past board meeting, you all had talked about doing the whole furlough, the whole discussion about it. Um, before I start into that, like I have a personal story about two teachers that affected my children, not affected, I'm sorry, impacted my children in such a positive way, they would probably not have the education they do if it wasn't for them. And that's Mrs. Cottom, and she's a fifth grade teacher at the elementary school, and that's Mrs. Polakoski. Um, Mrs. Polakowski, if it wasn't for her, for my youngest child, who is now in ninth grade, my daughter would have still been in eighth grade. She managed to pull her through every obstacle she could because she had such a hard time reading. Um, and I'm sure she's had more of an impact on many other kids, but it's just my personal, personal story. And Mrs. Cotton, we when we moved here from Florida, um, a lot of things happened down in Florida, and Mrs. Cotton got my senior now through all of her obstacles. And but sorry, I'm like, I just want to cry right now because it would just be so det detrimental if when we move through this furlough Florida that that isn't necessarily happening, but it's in discussion. If that would even it would just break my heart like completely. 
because they don't deserve it. I mean, these teachers are the bread and butter of this district. Without them, right you'd now. be nobody. So that's, that's you that wouldn't be sitting here. And we need to this furlough, Florida, that this furlough that should never really even be in this discussion. discussion. Especially say, when last board meeting, you voted to hire two people on. These teachers are the bread and butter. A basketball we assistant, them, which I have no problem to hire those on as a, as a, as a, you know, someone who's just in the community. I have no problem with that. Absolutely. But why would you talk about a furlough and then turn around and hire two people on? I mean, you voted to hire two people to be honest. Bread and butter. A basketball um, assistant, which I have these teachers had a walk in the other day. I mean, if I was one of them, I'd be walking out. Um, if I had 254 days in furlough and then turn around and nothing to show for it. I mean, who wants that? Like nobody, nobody can go through life like that and be expected to go through life like that and do their job. Do every job y'all have voted on for them to do. Jump through every hoop, every Zoom meeting. They've had to open up their homes. Like, what more do you want of them? I mean. They're all standing out there because they want their jobs, not just because they have compassion, but they have passion for their jobs. I mean, and I don't understand how you can talk about or even bring up and discuss about a furlough when you have administrators making three figures. I have no problem with administrators making three figures. They have the education for it. But I don't think it's fair if you can't pay the teachers to teach you know, these children who are our future, and you have people here that are like making three figures that get to vote whether they keep their job or not. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Doesn't add up to me. I don't know, it's sad. I mean, like, my next topic of discussion would be um, <laughs> these poor seniors. My gosh. I mean, They've been deprived of everything this year. I've just, I've, I've noticed um, across, I, I don't know if it's on the website or if it came through on like Google Classroom or something, but and I don't even know if this is y'all's problem, but they're talking about having prom down on the football field. I don't understand it, but okay. Um, charging close to maybe $75 a kid. The senior? It hasn't had nothing, nothing. They've been deprived of everything. Every memory they can't have. I know it's not 100% y'all's fault. I mean, you can't change the way this year's gone, but we can sure do better than a $75 ticket to a football field that we've taxed there to pay twice for. You know? I think it's ridiculous. I think, I don't know whoever keeps hearing me whatever land you're listening to me in but changing especially when you can't have a guest like what what is that 75 dollars, no guest have a good senior year guys it's sick um thank you mrs Aria. your time is out okay thank you Do we have any other citizen comments? No. No. Mr. Clara, that is much better. Okay, um, WIU 7 presentation on E Academy, and I believe they are joining us um, via yes. Zoom. That be Tim Hamill and Rebecca Anderson. Hello, can you hear us? Hello, Mr. Hamill, Dr. Hamill. Are you able to hear us? We, we can hear you. I'm not sure that you're hearing us. Dr. Dr. Hamill. Hello. Yeah, I- We can I hear you. We're not you hearing him hear and I don't think he's hearing us. We hear you. There you go. I can hear you. Okay, good. You can hear me? You got it? Yes. 
All right, great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate the the uh, time to uh, speak to you this evening. Uh, Mr. Masha asked us to uh, to join you. We've had uh, several conversations with uh, the admin at South Moreland over the last couple of weeks, and um, out of that conversation, I think that's what uh, what caused us to feel like this was a good idea to come speak to you tonight. So we do want to don't want to take too much of your time, but we uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the program and some of the things that we think are are very important for you to know and. Uh, moving forward, things that will help you make some uh, very important decisions. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Becky Henderson. Becky is our distance learning supervisor at the WIU, and she is responsible uh, for the daily operations of our eAcademy program. So she's very hands-on with everything that goes on. Uh, I wanted to begin just briefly by uh, mentioning the history of the program. Uh, e Academy is actually in its 13th year of existence. Um, we started at the request of the Westmoreland County School District's superintendents um, at that time, based on a need for a solution that would work to uh, kind of put a, a bit of a, a stopper to some of the drain that was happening from cyber charters at the time. We know that that's still an issue today, but it uh, we like to think that it would be an even greater issue if we had not stepped in with a solution locally. And uh, what makes us so unique is that at the time we developed this program, it was developed with a focus on building around the needs of our local school districts, not building a program that was purchased by uh, from a third party vendor or somebody who really doesn't know our curriculum locally. So what eAcademy focused on doing was building capacity within our own school districts to offer online learning. So across the last 13 years, we've been training teachers, building courses, school districts, building courses. And in the process uh, uh, over a decade later now, there are over 400 courses and uh, currently 100 and over 100 teachers who teach for our program. I might add that they are all teachers within Westmoreland County in Westmoreland County public schools. Not a single teacher that teaches for us is a an employee uh, is not an employee of school districts in our county. Uh, that's one of our our fast rules that we have for the program. Um, and I, I think that the other thing that's really important to, to mention is the tremendous cost difference in providing a full online course uh, setting for a student in eAcademy versus what our cyber charters that are out there charge for the same uh, circumstance. I'm going to let Becky talk to that point a little bit here. Becky, if you don't mind going over some of that, that pricing difference. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, we know the financial drain that tuition to cyber charters is causing on all of our districts across the county and across the state. Um, we were looking at some averages and some costs that the district specifically is incurring. And we know that to educate a regular education student in a cyber charter school right now for Southmoreland costs approximately $11,000 per student. If that student is classified as a special education student, having an IEP, a GIEP, or a 504 plan, that cost jumps up to almost $23,000 per student. In our case, the cost per student is under $3,200 to educate a student with a full suite of courses all of their technology equipment for the entire year. And that's because really what we are striving to do is to support the district. We are not trying to make money. We you know, talk frequently about the fact that we don't have private jets. <laughs> that's not what we're going for. The whole idea here is that we want to support you. We wanna support teachers in learning how to build high quality online instruction that is a true extension of what they're doing in the classroom. So when we talk about having local educators, that's a big point of pride for us. 
We want your teachers intimately involved because we don't want there to be an instructional gap that presents itself when a student leaves the physical classroom and goes into an online course. And if your teacher is involved in that process, that gap is eliminated substantially because what was happening in the classroom is also occurring online. As we're sitting here a year into a pandemic and everyone started to get forced into emergency remote learning, what everyone is now starting to realize is that there is some flexibility and some benefits to having an online opportunity for students as some of them really truly are thriving in an online environment. So when we bring the teachers in as part of the discussion and we talk about what's happening in the classroom, we can bridge that gap when we move into an online environment. And I think it's important to mention that, you know, these teachers that we've brought on board to teach within eAcademy, um, some of the concerns they had over a decade ago when this program started were questions concerning, will this replace me? Will this, is this a way for my district to, to replace me as a teacher? I have to tell you that in over a decade of existence, not one single teacher has been replaced because of online learning in our program. And in fact, we've created more work for teachers because of this program. Uh, there are many teachers who make an extra salary based on what they do for us in the academy. Um, there's more work for them on top of what they already do. It's they choose to do it. It's not like they're being told to do it but they're paid a salary for it as well. And that's an important part of the program is that we are supporting the teachers that do work for us within the program. There is a financial benefit to our districts that do this beyond just the lower cost uh, for doing online learning. One of those benefits is in the, uh, the concept of owning the courses that you put into our system. Many of our schools who've been doing this for over a decade have built their own library of coursework. They in turn put that coursework back into our catalog and it gets used within the districts in Westmoreland County and beyond. And every time their course gets used, every time it's a student enrolls in that course, the district that owns that course receives funding from that, that enrollment. Uh, this year, and, and this is an unusual year, of course, because of the sheer numbers of students, we have over 3,000 who are taking courses with us this year. But we have school districts who are going to generate, Becky, I'm gonna to turn to you for the number <laughs> because I know uh, you know it exactly. Uh, some of those we numbers have, are. We have a district that is looking to receive over $40,000 back in course reimbursements for enrollments into the courses that they own. Now, obviously that isn't something that is typical. Um, that is absolutely due to our current situation and how many students are online right now. That being said, the idea is that the more courses you build, the more courses you offer, the more money you can make back as a district to help offset your costs. So what we do see now are districts that are able to completely cover their consortium fee of $16,000 on a regular basis. In fact, they end up making more money than the consortium fee and we end up using that money to offset additional costs within the program, technology costs or enrollment fees. And for some of those districts that have moved so far along in this process, one of the things that, that we are finding is that they are now able to do more in-house within their own districts and not have to rely on the resources that are outside of their own district. For example, a district that builds their own courses with their own teachers now has the capacity to start to build some of that into their regular school day. And then there is no cost incurred for an outside resource, a teacher or somebody from eAcademy to be coming in to take on the work for the student. Um, that's when this really gets powerful because the ability to do online learning and not incur extra cost that's the ultimate goal. That's where we really want schools to be. It's just that it's very hard to get there. It takes a lot of effort and uh, dedication from an individual school district to get to that level. And a decade into this, we are almost now to the point where schools are, are beginning to arrive at that point. So it does take a while, but we are getting there. 
Uh, I mentioned the capacity building. That's a big part of this, uh, getting teachers trained, giving them the skills. And that's part of what our team does at the IU. Becky operates a, a very uh, a thorough training process for each of the teachers that, that teach for us. Uh, we do t- uh, share teachers across districts. So it's very important. There's consistency involved there. Um, but one of the key things in all of this, and I, I don't think we've mentioned this yet, and this is something that's unlike any other online program, and that is that these students remain your students, okay? We are not a cyber charter. We are not a cyber school, even. You are still the school. Your students remain your students when you're part of the academy, and they always remain South Moreland students or whatever district they're from, and they graduate from your district with your diploma. That's powerful and that's important to, for, for you as a school district to uh, consider. Um, this isn't like your, the students leaving and going to a, a cyber charter. That's when they almost essentially completely divorce your, them from your own school district. That doesn't happen here. Um, so that's one of the things that we're very proud of in, in what we do and how we do it. Um, the capacity building more is what we want to do. And I know that's part of what we've talked to your district about already in some of our uh, discussions with your administrators. Um, Becky, from, the, from your perspective on growing uh, things at South Moreland, what are some of the things you see coming? One of the things that you get to take advantage of is the fact that we currently have 128 educators that have been building courses in eAcademy for 13 years now. So your teachers have a countywide network of peers that they get to interact with, that they get to talk to, that they can brainstorm and bounce ideas off of, that when they're feeling a little overwhelmed with the process or or stressed out about trying something new, they have people that have been in that position and can help them through it. This is not something that we bring to a district and say, okay, we're gonna give you one day of training and you're off and running, you can do this by yourself. We are there every step of the way, as are our teachers. In fact, we even have a network of online education advisors or OEAs. Every single district has at least one OEA that is the main point of contact from more of an administrative standpoint. And that network is something that's available to your administrators as well. So there's support at the administrative level, there's support at the teacher level. And then our team at the IU is there every step of the way talking about how to build instructional content that makes sense for students at a variety of age levels, how to ensure that we're putting in a consistent approach so that students don't feel overwhelmed, how to make sure that teachers are delivering high quality, rigorous instruction in an online format that still makes sense for them and for students and how to transition everybody into an online learning environment. Because that's the one piece that I think sometimes is really missing from the conversation. When a student leaves the classroom and decides to go online, that's the equivalent of a transition from fifth grade to sixth grade, from middle school to high school. That's another transition that both students and parents need to be ready for. And we help districts to build those materials so that you can have a transition plan in place. So there are a lot of a lot of moving parts to our program, and and certainly we could spend hours talking about it, which we won't do. Uh, but we want to be respectful of your time. We know we've been talking for a while here. Uh, we'll we'll close with this. We, being the IU, we're here to serve you. We're we're that's our job. We service our school districts, and we build this program based on the needs of our own people. It's not built on what a, what a corporation wants or what some third party vendor wants. We build it based on what our school districts ask us for. And so I think because of that, we, we tend to get it right. We tend to get the, the, the right equation for what our districts need at any given time. So um, I'll close with that. And I'll, I'll certainly we're, we're willing to answer questions if you have any, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Hamill, Ms. Anderson. Questions about this stuff. Who do we ask? Mark, do we 
No, we kicked up. Uh, your uh, high school. You want to? Do you have questions questions now, you have questions now? Do you have questions now? classes. Mr. Haichu and Mrs. Sutton, can you please go to the podium? Uh, I have a list here that was given to me of the uh, SOLA classes, and I believe he said that they had 400 courses that they offer. Okay, this list has 110 on it. But 27 of those courses have zero students in them. So that goes down to 99 classes. Of those, about 23 have more than 10 students. The vast, vast, vast majority have like one or two. Some of them have three. Um, so how are we using these classes as part of our curriculum? I'm not sure if I know specifically which courses you are looking at. Each um, course that is created, sometimes there's multiple sections. So if a teacher reaches their cap, on that particular section, they create another section. So maybe you have more in the first section and then your second or third. And this year, there's even been even four sections of a course that have been offered. So without knowing the specific list, I don't know. I would say about 85% of these classes have one or two or three kids in them. I, I think what you're referring to is each student has specific needs for the graduation requirements. So the courses that the students are taking through SOLA are tailored to the individual students' needs. We are not paying for courses in which we don't have students enrolled. So our student enrollments are based on the courses those individual students are choosing, not only for the um, course content, courses that they need for graduation requirements, but also for their electives. So in the span of courses and offerings that are available through SOLA, that doesn't necessarily mean that South Orleans School District students would be taking advantage of every one of those courses, if that makes sense. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it could just mean we have one student from South Moreland enrolled in that class and there's a hundred other across the district also enrolled in that class. Okay. It's probably paid for the courses that you enrolled. Right. So if you only have one student enrolled in that particular class, you would pay for that one. So there's no way for us to know how many students really take advantage of this in the, in the whole IU, right? We would just know South Moreland. For example, uh, there are the biggest classes there are is uh, phys ed is 79. Is that right? The present, the PRES 79 and um, 18. And uh, those are the big numbers, phys ed. I think phys ed is one of those courses that the students are required to have every year, right? So a high school student is required to have a phys ed every year of your high school enrollment. So you're going to have a higher number for that course. I see like a, a lot of math classes and things like that. They don't have maybe one kid in them, but then you say they're joined in with all the other kids from the IU. But this is what is costing us the $456,000 then, these classes. Are there any other questions? Can you can you tell me how many of our teachers are, are doing this? 
We have currently have one teacher okay. that has created a course. Just one. Yeah. Was that prior to this year, Mr. Haichu, or is this oh. something they just started this year? I think that offering that particular teacher has started this last year. This program has been in effect about 15 years, hasn't it? I think they said this is our eighth year. 13 years. And this is the first time we've had a teacher contribute to that. Okay. I just didn't know. I mean, I, re I, re I remember when it started. And um, I remember it started at Kiski. They were the first people that started doing the classes. Do you have anything else, Dr. Clark? Thank you. We're going to move into the special voting agenda items. Return to school plan. The board is asked to consider the approval of the return to school plan. Okay, the return date signifies a change from the AB hybrid instructional model to a five day per week in person instructional model for the school district. Once the district returns to school for their five days per week in person instruction, they will be attending Monday through Friday. Additional return to school information relative to your child's specific grade level or school will be coming directly from each of those individual buildings. Please note that we are still providing a five day per week remote option for students that choose to not attend in person at all. Please be certain to contact your, your child's school if they intend to change their mode of instruction. It must be noted that social distancing will be followed to the greatest extent possible and masking requirements will be followed also. Also keep in mind that these plans are contingent upon the continued decrease in COVID-19 cases per in the, in the county. And there will be a Google form for the fourth nine weeks instructional model that if the board approves the model would be uh, released or open tomorrow. We're asking parents to complete the form or contact your child's school for any changes. Uh, and there, this form must be completed for each child requesting a change. That way we have accurate numbers within the schools as to who is doing what. That form will open upon approval or whatever happens this evening. That would be open on uh, tomorrow, 312, and it would close one week later, 319, so that the schools could accurately uh, prepare for any uh, of the opening that might be decided. Our third nine weeks ends uh, on the 25th. Uh, I am advocating or asking the board to please consider uh, a full return on April 8th. Uh, the way our scheduling, our way our calendar falls this year, it's kind of awkward with the uh, third nine weeks closing that prior week. Then we have three days uh, of classes and then we would be off for a week. Uh, it's gonna be difficult for kids to get back into the flow of things. And if we were just bringing back, bring them back after Easter, that would allow for, I think a little bit more continuity. So we're asking for the board to consider, please return uh, our students on April 8th. Uh, Full-time again, remote, once again, remains an option. And once again, under all circumstances, the schools will try to establish social distancing and and it will be followed to the greatest extent as well as the masking requirements. So I'd ask the board to please consider allowing or voting for our students to return on April 8th. Thank you. Is there like is there a logistical reason why we want to wait almost a month or is it just because the nine weeks end and that feels like a good time? I well, really we, hate to see us waiting. We've already waited so long to get back in school. I hate to see us waiting essentially another month to get back into the school for five days. We are close to the end of the, the third nine weeks. There are students that are on the A schedule and the B schedule. So it, it, the transition back into if we, even if we voted whatever, let's just say the 15th is just, we're, we're coming really close to the end of the, the third nine weeks. 
That's going to be a transition thinking, period. What I was looking at was the 22nd, because if you gave everyone until the 19th to decide if they were making any changes, then that would be the following Monday that gives us some time to actually go back to the five days before we then break for Easter. It just feels like, I mean, April 8th, that's almost a month from now. And I, I, know, we, I know people have been waiting a long time. And, and if there's no real hard and fast reason why we're waiting, I'm just trying to to figure out if there's any like logistical reason why we couldn't do it a little bit sooner. Well, I think the most important thing is that we're near the end of that third nine weeks and we already have, we're gonna to have to get teachers, their, their, their grade books, their rosters, their, their uh, classes all reorganized. Uh, I think that, that it could be a little bit of a difficulty I do think that, uh, you know, we're three days out from the end of the third nine weeks. And I, I think a clean transition would be the beginning of the fourth nine weeks. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, we are off the 31st to the 7th. So that, that one week is basically spring recess, too. Yes, sir. Can you repeat the problems again? I know you said great books and well we we have in setting up the virtual classrooms we moved a lot of desks out of those classrooms to allow for and, and also within other classrooms where there were uh the social distancing requirements so we have to physically move a lot of uh, content back into the rooms I think uh, probably just as important is that we have teachers that have A students and B students. We're going to have to melt and mix those those classes together again because they they have specific rosters assigned for those classes. So we would it, it would be past you know to get that done in a, in a real short period of time. But I mean it obviously could be done. But I think that would be a challenge. We are so close to the end of the third nine weeks. Clean cut would be starting everything back up in the fourth nine weeks. Can you please can you please elaborate on that second paragraph in there? Um, I'm looking at this as if they give you some numbers, you're going to shut the school down again. Is that what that's saying? I, I did not hear you. So. That second paragraph says all plans contingent upon continued decrease in COVID, so forth, these community spread, so forth. So if you get some kind of numbers from the county or something, does that mean we're going to shut the schools down again? Yes, so like you, you have to keep in mind that there is still the potential for COVID. COVID. I mean, even though uh, a lot of our first grade effort has been made to get a lot of people vaccinated, and there are a lot of people that have been vaccinated, we still have to follow whatever being uh sent to us uh, via the continued, if there's an increase in COVID, we still have to follow some guidelines. Uh, keep in mind also that there are still uh, guidelines that we have to follow once we do bring students back, if there are outbreaks, we still have to follow closures along those lines. So we, we're still dependent upon what does happen within the community as far as COVID outbreaks and, and the number of cases. So what, do you, so what do you do if we get some kind of a a report from the county or something we close the schools down we go back to a b what do we do well we would we would if there were if we go back in a substantial that would definitely change things if we have uh, a number of cases of, of uh, confirmed covid within the buildings we have to follow guidelines uh, issued to us by the department of health which could necessitate closures of schools for you know a period of time they might be decreasing the number of days that that could occur, but I mean, we are still bound if there, if there are a number of cases within a school week, we have to follow those guidelines. Well, based on what some of the other people are saying, shouldn't we strike while the iron is hot, while the COVID cases are down? Shouldn't we get the kids in school as fast as we can? Because they may end up being shut down again um, based on this information. So, I would like to see us go back on the 29th. I'd really like to see us return on the 22nd, but the 29th would be a clean cut. It would be 
basically the start of the nine weeks. The start of the nine weeks is Friday. I think that doesn't make a lot of sense to return on a Friday and then meet out again, although we would already have students in the building on an AB model anyway. It's not like we would be, you know, we would just be bringing them all back the first day at the end of the nine, the start of the nine weeks. Um, that leads us into three days the following week, which then leads us into Easter break. And if we decide in those three days or four days that we would be back, that there was an issue and something needs to be adjusted, there would be time over that Easter break to deal with that versus us coming back on the 8th, having, you know, the 8th is what day of the week? It's a Thursday. Thursday. Um, you know, yeah, you have two days back and then moving into a weekend again to make adjustments. Just think if we're talking clean break, that's the end of the third nine weeks. Why would we go basically four more days of remote instruction before we went back to in person? Well, I mean, is there a reason that we can't then just make, I mean, I know it's a Friday, but if the 26th is the first day of the new nine weeks, I mean, you already have half of the population in the building anyway. If we want to say, okay, the, the beginning or ending of the nine weeks is a pertinent point, can we just say the 26th, first day of the last nine weeks? Yeah, it's Friday, but you already have people there anyway. You're only bringing back half of the students. I just that gives us a week after that. Um, after they have to after that would make close, any changes. You have to make your decision which way you want to go. That would give us a full week almost to. I mean, and that's getting things in place. It's two weeks from tomorrow, so I feel like that's two weeks of being able to physically prepare whatever needs prepared. <clears throat> I mean. I just, and I know I've been one of the board members who's, you know, had us do virtual or had us do hybrid, but I do agree with Dr. Fike in terms of the striking while the iron is hot. I mean, people are anxious to go five days a week and I understand some of the logistical issues, but I also don't want to put it off and then end up having something come up and we're like, okay, now we can't do it. I mean, if we can do it and we want to do it now and everyone feels comfortable with doing it, I think we need to do it as quickly as we can. Mr. I don't understand. There's 13 days between the start of the fourth nine weeks and when our kids go back to school. 13 days. Part of that is Easter break. Yeah, but how much Easter break do you need? You just need well, I mean, one Easter, day. <laughs> Easter <laughs> break is on the schedule from, from I think it starts the first and then uh, goes through the eighth of the spring break. So they don't come back to the building till the 8th. So if we went back on the 26th, that would give them all four days in person before we would go on Easter break. Why would you need all those days? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's already ended on the school calendar and that was approved last summer. So that's where we're, we are. That's already, that's the school calendar. So we can't really vote to change that right now. Mr. Marsh, I'm assuming we've talked to the teachers and they're ready to go. We can be prepared for whatever we need. So they'd be ready to go. We're ready to go. Okay. I just think, you know, 29th, if you're really talking about a clean break beginning in the nine weeks, I can understand three days before that. But, you know, once again, I keeping into consideration bringing kids back and then transitioning back. You know, I think the 22nd, I think it's just. I mean, we're three days out from the end of the third nine weeks. I just think a clean break would be to get a fourth nine weeks. I'm good with 26. Stay tuned. Last nine weeks. Started from the last nine weeks, and that's where we're going from. Can you put that in a motion, please? Uh, I make a motion to bring the students back to the buildings five days a week, effective March 26. I need a second. Second. Second, Heather Smith. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polakoski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Heather Smith? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mrs. William? Yes. Motion carries a yes, one option. Okay, request for proposals for paraprofessionals. 
board is asked to consider authorizing the administration to seek request for proposals for staffing of paraprofessional employees. A motion of and seconded by be it resolved that the South Moreland Board of School Directors approves the form of the request for proposals to provide age for special needs students. RFP here to attach. Number two approves the secretary advertising once a week for three successive weeks in the daily carrier and following additional advertisement, if any. Uh, no, you that would have to be filled in if there are additional advertising requirements. And the treasurer is authorized to pay, therefore. Number three, companies known to the district may be invited to register for and request the request for proposals to provide aid for special needs students from the board secretary as stated therein. Number four, the school board adopts the following schedule to be inserted where appropriate in the RFP. Advertised the week of March 15th, 22nd, 29th, 2021. The proposal state would have to determine. The initial board review would be determined and the both to select and not select provider and options would be, de be determined. And number five, the school board reserves the right to invite any and all companies responding to pre present information at this board meeting on, and that is to be determined. When will we get these proposals? When will we get these proposals? That's part of the thing that needs to be decided uh, as to there will be a due date and then a uh, examination of them and put in the board docs to be given to the school board. I was under the impression that Mr. Novikoff was going to be giving us an explanation of the whole. Before we vote on this, so we would have to know what the date is. Uh, I gave you a um, in a schedule here. Uh, it could be altered. Uh, advertise the weeks of March 15, 22, and 29. Proposals due on Friday, April 9th, 115. Providing board docs on Tuesday, April 13th, for discussion on April 15th. And I, I would add potentially make that the date for inviting um, presentations that the people will bid unless it's a really large number and it needs to be slimmed down. Um, and then the other decision is whether to vote that night, the 15th, or wait till May in order to um, further evaluate the plans. Um, one of the options is for them, there are two ways that we've outlined this for them to follow a certain pathway about the current salaries or certain current wages, et cetera. The third option is for them to propose something that they want to propose. And that may be very creative or maybe they're all just going to hug the line. We don't know. I see Mr. Novikov sort of chomping at the bits out there. I can't hear anything Mr. Platonic said. I can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to happen. I'll use this code. Personally, I think the one I'm going to present will be the best one. And I 
I want I, I don't think we can fair to say he has said things, but here's what Alex is gonna tell you. And then go look for it. That's kind of like I come without it. So what I'd rather do is let's contact AOT. I'm not sure if that's the um, uh, AOT, um, he says it's COVID, he has that again. My my subscription company has them to make their proposal and uh, bring them in to present to see the way the road is on the company to put them out there. So, to me, this is a small group of people. Right. If you were to try my class, I like to tell the way. Is one week okay? One week from when to when? To advertise. No. One week. Do we have to do it? We don't have to do it for three weeks. You don't have to do three, but um, I think what you could do is you could still technically try to advertise the three Mondays, uh, but have them do. That would be the 15th, 22nd, 29th. Have them do on the 30th. Now, if you don't, if you only want to do two weeks, the 15th and the 22nd, maybe have them do on the 25th, Thursday. And then, and then, um, you would have them ready for your April planning meeting for them to come in and do a presentation and vote on the 15th. Is there okay, a, can I make a motion? Is, can I ask a question? <laughs> you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, if this is a very small group of people who do this type of work, is it, are we able to, just send them our proposal package. Um, I mean, still the way I have it, the way it's set up, and the way I think it should be, is that we need them to ask for it okay. and register with uh, probably Mrs. Carson uh, with their contact information. They have then sent the entire package. So you could solicit them, send them the entire package. And then there's a deadline if they have questions for clarifications or perceived errors. So that they have a deadline to, to do that and then to make a response to everybody who got the package. Now, if you just send it out from the very beginning and don't advertise at all, you're eliminating the possibility that there might be somebody else out there that, you know, wants to get in on it so uh because it's a service rather than uh, uh equipment or supplies you literally could do away with advertising but then you're losing the possibility of bringing in somebody new that you just didn't see now you don't have to do other newspapers i gave you a lot of options here you can go with the courier and see what happens Mr. Novikov, do you know who you're reaching out to? Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, put it this way. We Okay. So if we advertise one time yeah, and you I reach know, out. I like to see an page or I don't know. Sure. But I do have a rough idea on like five pages that, that I can probably send that I can probably call to say, hey, and you'd be willing to reach out to the ones you know yes yeah, yeah, yeah. okay may i make a motion yes, okay i would like to make a motion to advertise for one week march 15th the proposals will be due is the 24th, good. Give them a week. 24th. Initial board review would be at our first meeting in April on the 8th. And vote on the 15th. I 
I need a second. I'll second that discussion. I just had a question. Is that going to is that going to be enough time to get all that done? All of getting all the information back. Yes, for us to be able to vote on it. Yeah, I, I, uh, part of um, most of the rates are really standard, so they, they already have their number. We're asking, we're giving them more time because we're asking for some things like pay, what would pay time off look like in the system, and that's so that's some of the like, things that we're asking them to present us with. Is different. Most of the flat rates, they are what they are. They they already have those numbers, and, and, and that's what the service is. So. Um, the time that they're getting is really just to um, make a pitch of why we should consider their uh, contract as opposed to um, another option. So I do think it's not because um, most of the stuff is pretty standard. Could I ask for a clarification on the April 8th review? Would that include a presentation? Or is if it they just, want to. just to review the paper or can, can the vendors come in and present? I'm fine with them. Well, yeah, sure. They can present if they want to. Is that something you would, aren't they presenting to you? I, I, I would really, at your discretion, want a presentation. I mean, if a company, there are companies I talked to a couple of weeks ago that are going to be $27 an hour, $10 more now than what we pay now. Right. It's a new point. So I don't want them to come in because. I don't want to waste your time, but there are some companies that are in that ballpark to make peace. I'd rather be your discretion. You know, I can present you with some people you want to hear from, you want me to review and then recommend. Is or... that possible? If Mr. Novikov narrows it down? If Mr. Novikov, this is not a true Sorry. bidding process. So if Mr. Novikov would narrow it down, or you, with Mr. Masha, whoever, it wouldn't just be him, obviously. Would, would it be the best three or just there's no number at all? Whoever he thinks would be appropriate. Then you're, you're ceding all that discussion to them. That's up to you. Correct. That's that's what I would hope for. I don't want to bring someone in here that we don't want to waste their time and I don't want to waste yours. So even if my thought would be that if I would recommend inviting that in, regardless, I would still show the paper of every single proposal. Anyway. Correct. So right. even if I said, you know, there might be I think that that would be the transparent way that, that, that it would be clear as to why I did not have yes. someone to come in versus somebody else, I believe. And then I think that would probably be the best way to handle it. I don't want to have a three hour meeting with presentations. Um, that, that I think you would know best what's best for our district and kids and staff that's already here. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can stop it, but I don't know right. if we literally go through the process of seeing every single. Um, presentation that we can. So um, I, I would appreciate the opportunity, and I know I would be okay with, with doing that. I have a question, Mr. Novikoff. It says here in this um, uh, motion that we're going to request a proposal for the staffing of paraprofessional employees. What do you mean by paraprofessional employees? Which, which jobs are those? Personal care assistants and classroom assistants, and this year, we started utilizing in-home care assistance at a higher rate. And I know we're asking even for companies if they have proposals for more specialized care as part of their offer as well. But, but typically, our classroom assistants and our autistic support and life skills support classroom and our personal care assistants, those 19 current positions we have, those are the primary uh, positions we're talking about. Okay, well, I'm confused then because are we talking about rehiring the people that used to work here? If, if that's an option. So there, there come some, some issues here because if we look to a different third party vendor, there are some um, exclusivity issues we have with ESS releasing them, which we'll have to talk about if we like another third party offering. If we decided to hire back, we probably would, would be hiring pretty much everyone who's working for ESS and trying to hire them back as our employees if we so choose to do it. Okay, well, or we may go with ESS again if they change an offer and modify what they're doing. Well, then are you going to give a presentation too? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, someone jumped the gun, that's not till later, but tonight I have some, some early numbers during the superintendent's report that review um, projected costs of what it would look like for us to hire 
pair is back in the same fiscal uh, range as what ESS. So offers. we will know that before we hear from any of the other companies. Yeah, you'll 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 get a preview of that tonight. Okay, I didn't know that, Mr. Novikov. Uh, another clarification: We have in board docs still a job description for paraprofessional job description, and we have the CBS job description. And then in the specs, there, there is mention of the in-home paraprofessional. Yes. Is it um, correct to say that we should be deleting the CBS? Yes, so the CBS job description so that we're only going with the professional, paraprofessional job description. And then that could be either a personal care assistant or a classroom assistant because both of them are described in the documents. And the third one, the only difference is it's in home. Yeah, the, the, the job description you're referencing was drafted by me when we were considering some of these long-term vacancies as higher need positions. But I think as like when we discussed, I don't wanna tell another company how to do their business. I say, these are the paraprofessionals we want. You tell us your best offer. If they have some sort of incentive bonus that they use and that's how they're gonna tell us that our staffing's great and here are our references, that's, that's fine. Um, but I don't wanna tell them to fill a position that I kind of drafted as a, um, an example of what a high needs position would be. So I would, I would prefer just be paraprofessional and just be classroom assistant and personal care assistant and leave it at that with the, with the um, job description that Mr. Clara drafted a few years ago when we first switched to ESS. So the actual breakdown is on page two of this packet under C1, basic requirements, job descriptions are attached as exhibit B, but there's only gonna be that one because we're not gonna do the CBS for the positions in this subsection and in the persons providing the services, whether individually or collectively are referred to in the RFP as workers. The job descriptions for paraprofessional applies to both the paraprofessional personal care assistant who works with a student and the paraprofessional classroom assistant who assists the teacher with the entire class. And workers are to be able to be assigned to either category as needed. The in-home paraprofessional works with only one student in the student's home. So you essentially have uh, three classifications, but two of those are the same rate of pay in our proposal for number one and number two. That's correct. And in the in-home the in-home para was added this year during the pandemic, but it's very relevant. I think we have kids who go through homebound instruction and they have needs that it may come up again. It doesn't mean that they permanently be at that rate, but um, I think it's something that's not gonna go away anytime soon. So um, we, I'd like to see what that offer would be as well. So I think it's relevant. The only difference is they go into a home. Is that all right? Yes. To the people who made the motion, did everybody understand? Yeah. Mike, am I heard now? Can you hear me? Are okay. we voting on this C2 proposals? This, this is exactly the motion. With this the way C2. it's been filled in by Mrs. Smith. What? With the way she filled it in for the designated blanks. Right. That, this is actually the motion. That's it. That's yeah. it right there. Okay. It's not what's on the agenda. This is the motion. No, it, it's in there. It's under board docs. Okay. And is the daily courier the best possible place to advertise that? Or the only place we should be advertising? It's because our, it, it's our designated newspaper. That's why I chose it. Right. I'm just asking if that's the only place we should be advertising. I'm a teacher. I, I don't know much about marketing or human resources. So, I mean, I would defer to people who do this professionally, I would, I would understand why you might want to make it broader. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I, I apologize. I don't, I don't know to recommend to go broader to go if that's adequate or not. The way search engines go when that job's posted, it gets picked up other places. I, I, I couldn't really offer you a- um, I'm good with just the daily career. But we voted earlier as a board to designate that particular paper as our means of, I mean, we have, we're on record as saying that's it, that's where we go to advertise, right? We right, would have we to, also we would have to advertise change. other places. I'm fine with just Daily Courier. Okay, that's fine. 
the motion would include just the daily courier as stated. Have a motion and a second. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Palakowski? Yes. Mr. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries seven with two absent. Board is asked to authorize an early retirement incentive plan 2021 known as ERIP for qualified SEA staff member. Board is also asked to approve the memorandum of understanding and the release and waiver form of tax. Both of those documents all done. I'll make a motion to accept the early retirement incentive plan for teachers. We need a second. I'll second. That, that's to include the MOU. It's to include all, all of them. The MOU. Yes. Yes. Discussion? Yes. Yes, I would like to discuss this very much so. I think the public needs to know the truth about what these ERIPs are. That's an Early Retirement Incentive Program. Since this program started, the Southmoreland School District has paid $7,859,932 to people not to work here. If they add in the proposed ERIP now that they have on the table, we will, as a district, have paid $8,303,932 to people not to work here. Now, over the years, I have heard people repeatedly say, where is the savings? What are the savings? Show us the savings. We got this information and I, I thank the administration for giving this to us. Since 2006, 84 teachers have received this retirement bonus. I believe last year, every teacher got $84,000. I think it's what it was. Of those 84 teachers, 80, 83% of those positions have been filled afterwards. 83% of the positions that they quote, eliminated were filled, 83%. I've gone back and I've looked over these, these documents for a long time. And I didn't lump this all together because if you retired in 2006 or seven or eight, you weren't making the $80,000 that the teachers are making now at the top salary. But I've calculated and calculated and calculated. And over the years, we have paid, already paid $7,859,932 and as close as I can come, we have saved $1,336,189. I think that we live in, an, in, in a, a community where the taxpayers have to be considered for what is going on here. It, the, the budget that has been presented to us already contains a substantial tax increase. Now, I asked a couple of times for a budget with no tax increase. I've not seen it yet, and that's okay. I'm probably not going to get one. But when you're asking people to pay taxes, the amount of money, almost the amount of money that comes in on this tax increase will be paid to people who do not work here. They don't work here. They're going to get this money. They get it over a period of six years, or this year it's supposed to be five years, or whatever, whatever the deal is. But... If this, if this early retirement incentive program goes through, you need to know that Southmoreland will have paid $8,303,932 to people who do not work here. We have only had two budget meetings. We have received information from the administration. There have been no input, no proposals from the board regarding this budget. We have not looked at 
uh, anything that, that can be proposed to balance this budget, this action is being taken before we even talk about what has to be done to balance the budget in this school district. But I want people to know that this is what, this is where your money's going. This, I, I, you know, if you do this one year and don't hire the teachers back, that's one thing. But to date, we have hired 83% of the people back who got paid not to work here. And the, I, I think it has devastated the district. I listened very carefully to the auditor when he gave his last report. And he said that one of the major concerns in Southmoreland are these huge ERIP payments. And this will go on for years to come. So it doesn't matter. You're guaranteed a tax increase in my, in my mind forever just to pay off these bills. I think this is a destructive thing. I would beg this board, please don't do this to Southmoreland. We can't absorb any more of this kind of economic destruction. May I say something? So I cannot speak for anything before a year ago when I got on this board. I don't know what the exact numbers are that we've paid out in ERIPs. However, I do feel that an early retirement incentive plan is one thing that we can give the teachers that they do deserve. I think that if they are leaving this district after serving it for so many years, I think that this is something that we can give them. And I have done the numbers myself. And Dr. Fike mentioned that we save if we don't hire them back. The last thing I want to do is to not hire teachers back. I'm going into this with the assumption that we are going to give this incentive to the teachers and we're going to replace them because I don't want to lose any teachers. I want to replace every single teacher who could possibly take this incentive plan. So for instance, if we take a teacher who is paid at the top pay scale of $79,000 and you work in Pizzers and everything, and we hire someone on step one, and we take into account everything, we would save $28,000. There's a savings. I cannot speak for the years before this, but I also would insist that if we're going to offer this ERIP, we plan to hire back teachers. There's going to be teachers leaving, I'm assuming, that we need, we can't lose more teach our kids need these programs they need the teachers and there is a way if you go through the steps for the next five years through this we save one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars so you do save and that's going through each step increase for that new teacher and taking into account the e-rip that we would pay the teacher who is left so these are my numbers i've sent them to mr Masha and mr marnell they verified them there is a savings. This is something that we negotiated, not that I think negotiated is the wrong word, that we discussed with the union and they were in agreement with this. I think this is something that we can do and it's a step in the right direction. I just wanted to let everybody know what, what that is, the dollar amount, um, we didn't discuss that. So our offer is for six teachers to retire. Um, there is, they would have to have a minimum of 15 years continuous service in the school district. The minimum age requirement would be 50. They would have to have 15 years in teasers, which obviously they would if they've been here for 15 years. And they would be receiving $14,000 a year for five years. Is there any other discussion? I worked on part of it after the main negotiation. There, there were some things that were clarified. Years ago, no, no, you can have a minimum age. That would be a big problem. A maximum. Age discrimination. Yes. Opposite of age discrimination. 
anything. I'm sorry. Opposite of age discrimination. Not in the law. It's not called reverse age discrimination. No. That's not a, that's not a thing. Not yet. You can try. <laughs> I just Googled it. Well, the, the, you, you have the statute and it's not designed to protect people of a younger age. What was the hand for? I, 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 that's all I have to say. That's all. That's all. Raymond. Yes. Mrs. Rhodes. Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith. Yes. Mr. Carson. Yes. Dr. Pike. No. Mrs. Williams. Yes. Motion carries. Six yes, one no, two absent. A description for head coach, head middle school coach, and assistant coach. Board is asked to consider the approval of the job descriptions for head coach, head middle school coach, and high school and or middle school assistant coach. A motion. I'll make the motion. Roll call though. Oh, I'm sorry, discussion. Roll call. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Um, <clears throat> yeah, yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polkowski? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries, seven yes, two absent. Job description for volunteer coaches. Board is asked to consider the approval of the volunteer coaching job description. We need a motion. I'll make the motion. I need a second. second. Discussion. Roll call. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries, seven yes, two absent. Post middle school boys assistant basketball coach. Board is asked to authorize the administration to post and subsequently advertise if no internal candidates apply for the position of middle school boys assistant baseball coach. I'll make the motion. I need a second. Sorry. Roll call. I'm sorry, discussion. That's how I want to go. Roll call. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Pike? Yes. Mr. Palakowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Seven, two absent. Volunteer Middle School Boys Assistant Baseball Coach. Board is asked to consider the approval of Drew Ledbetter as volunteer middle school boys assistant baseball coach. I need a motion. I'll make the motion. motion. Second. 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 Roll call. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? I'm sorry. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Mrs. Perry? Seven yes, two absent. Volunteer high school boys baseball coach. Board is asked to consider Charlie Basham 
as volunteer high school boys assistant baseball coach. I need a motion. I'll make the motion. I need a second. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Carson. Yes. Dr. Fike. Yes. Mr. Polakowski. Yes. Mrs. Raymond. Yes. Mrs. Rhodes. Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith. Yes. Mrs. Williams. Yes. Motion carried. Seven to absent. Mrs. Williams. Can I um, add an item to the agenda now so that it could have some time for citizens to call in and comment on? Yes. Okay. I would like to add the job description and title for Mr. Smithola and his job, his title would be, give me one second. Uh, computer network administrator. He is currently without a title or a job description and he does not belong to any contract group. I, part of this motion would be to, at this time, keep his salary as is, but to effective immediately add him to the F93 group. So that so, was in addition to. That's in addition to the agenda. So you need a second and then a voice vote. And then later on, there, uh, it doesn't have to be a roll call, it could be a voice vote. And then later on, after our break, um, there would be the, if, if anybody from the public or present wants to comment on it because it's being added. Group those for, for the end if you can. So we're just voting to add it to the agenda. So I'll right. motion. I'll second. The agenda. And motion that's been made. I'll second. second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Voice vote. Voice vote. All those in favor? Say yes. aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And there will be time afforded if anybody wanted to comment on that prior to us adjourning, prior to citizens comment. Prior answer. to voting on it substantively. Yes. yes. So they can call in if they, they have anything to say about that. They yeah. Can call in. yeah. Spring sports guidelines. Board is asked to consider the approval of the spring sports guidelines. I don't know, Mr. Boring, would you like to add anything to it or, or expound on anything? Unless they have any questions on this. I need a motion. I'll make the motion. And a second. I'll second. Discussion. Roll call. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polkowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries seven to seven yes, two absent. Board policies. The board shall exercise leadership through its rulemaking power by adopting board procedures and policies for the organization and operation of the school district. Those procedures and policies, which are not dictated by the statute or regulations of the state board or ordered by a court of competent authority, may be adopted, amended, or repealed at any meeting of the board providing the proposed adoption, amendment, or repeal has been proposed at a previous board meeting and has remained on the agenda for each succeeding board meeting until approved or rejected. The board is asked to consider the review of the policy's 800 section operations by the policy committee as constitution, constituting the first read for proposed board policies for policy 003. Board is asked to discuss policy 832 and for the public to submit any concerns regarding the policy to the administration. In looking at the uh, approval policy process, uh, 832, it was strongly encouraged by PSDA representative that there needs, in order for that to be approved by the board, that there should be direct input from teachers, uh, parents, students, and board members. So that is why that is being asked to be. Uh, discussed in open for discussion. And I want to thank uh, Mrs. Smith and her committee because they have been uh, 
doggedly reviewing these policies and moving them along. And the 832 policy, if, if parents or community members, students have any um, questions or comments or anything that they would like to see in this policy, they can email Mr. Nash. Yeah, they can email me. And if you're also uh, willing to uh, add input, uh, please feel free. We can, we can organize a Zoom conference at this time. We're still remote. But if you would like to be a part of that process, please also email me and I will uh, add you to the list of potential uh, group who will evaluate or discuss that policy. And if, if the public does not know how to get, actually, can they see the draft policy? I'm not uh, sure they can. No, I might, I might have to. So, I might have to. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I might have will, to get that moved over to our uh, website. Yes, so that it'll be available on the website. Yes. Yes, good. good uh, yes, good point because uh, the public cannot see draft Correct. proposals for any board policy, so that would have to be moved over to uh, our website. I need a motion. So moved. You need a second. I'll second. Discussion. I have several questions. In this first um, section here, you said that. Um, you could um, amend, adopt, or repeal. So, can you give me an example of when that has ever happened? Uh, there have been uh, instances where uh, a policy has been submitted to PSBA. Uh, it might, uh, there might have been discussion from a board. If that does open up the process, where if uh, uh, there, the process is the, the committee would go through the policy, uh, add input and then uh, define what the parameters would be. That, those parameters are then submitted to BSBA. The representative there transfers those over into a, a defined form. Those then are the, the, the availability for the draft. Those are what is, that, that's what would be presented to the board for the first read. Uh, that is also what would be posted for the public. Uh, upon that posting, if uh, there are questions or, or concerns uh, that could be addressed and that would constitute the possibility of, of uh, further discussion. Has, has this ever happened where they, it was uh, amended or repealed? I am not, not since I have been in this position, but I can't speak for it. Okay, so there was a, a, a policy that was proposed to the board and I had very serious, very, very serious concerns about it. Nothing changed. So um, that really doesn't matter then. So it's whatever the board votes, then that's it regardless. Is that right? I would say it's the majority of the board, correct? Yes. What? I think majority of the board. Yeah, so it really is. Yeah. So it's just a matter of getting five votes and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, I could assure the board and, and maybe Mrs. Smith could reaffirm that, but I know that there's been a lot of effort putting into looking at these policies and trying to uh, make them. And truthfully, most of them, the majority of the policies that we're doing right now are straight from state code. It's, it's what we have to do. We just haven't approved them in four or five years and we were really late in it. So this policy 832 says that if somebody has a comment or a suggestion or something, they offer it, is that right? Yes. That's not what the policy says. Yes. But if you have a question or a comment or input about the policy, we're, we will then, you can send it to Mr. Masha and then he can review it. Okay, but I did that, Christy, I did that. I For raised this? concerns about a policy. It was on classroom observations, you remember that? Yes, but that's not what this policy, okay, policy 832 is about education Excuse equity. Hey, is that correct? Yes. About education equity. And we have to get input from, they suggest getting input from parents and the community because it affects everyone. So that Where is, is policy 832. Where is that policy? It's in board docs. I don't know if they gave it to you or not. Okay, because this list on the next page goes to 830. It stops at 830. I yeah, those those are the out. policies that are going to be asked. Yeah, to be yeah. Okay. 
832 is not up for discussion there. Yeah, that 832 is still open for discussion. We're not voting on 832 yet. We're just bringing it up tonight so people have time to look at it until next week, and then we'll vote on it. Can I ask a question? Yes. I, I'm not clear as to whether the existing requirement of the first reading or the first uh, bringing it to the board, the posting of it has to be separated by at least 30 days from final adoption because the way it's phrased in here. Is that being changed or is that being kept? That, that was not- I didn't case. touch any of that. That is you. <laughs> You're the lawyer. I didn't touch any of that. I just looked at the policies. Our committee did. We didn't have anything to do with how many days or- Who's yes, on the policy committee? Myself, Mrs. Rhodes, and Heather Smith. Who's the third one? Mrs. Smith. Heather Smith. Heather Smith. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Masha was part of it. We also brought in Mr. Kiefer to help with, there was some stuff to do with security. So he came in and advised us on certain things. Have you had public meetings? Have there been public meetings? They were public meetings, yes. Public. Yes, every one of them. They were Zoom? Correct. Anybody show up? Just us. Mr. Palakowski? Mrs. Raymond? Yes. yes. <laughs> Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Pike? I guess yes. I guess. <laughs> Mrs. Yes. Williams? Yes. Motion carries seven. Yes. Two absent. Posting of board policies, 800 operations. I just lost connection. Mr. Platonic read it so we can keep moving. I, 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 I didn't hear you. Mr. Masha lost his connection. Can you please read it so we can I, keep moving? I have it. Never mind. The board is asked to consider authorizing the administration to post for 30 days the policy 800 section. The policies including R800 records management. 801 public records, 802 school organization, 803 school calendar, 804 school day, 805 emergency preparedness and response, 805.1 relations with law enforcement agencies, 805.2 school security personnel, 806 child abuse, 806 formatted for board adoption version, 807, opening exercises, flag displays. 808, food services. 810, transportation. 810.1, school bus drivers and school commercial bus or motor vehicles, or drive, I'm sorry, vehicle drivers. Oh, class, call me. 810.2, transportation, video, audio, recording. 810.3, school vehicle drivers. 811 bonding, 812 property insurance, 813 other insurance, 814 copyright material, 815 acceptable use of computer network, digital technology, and internet, 818 contracted services personnel, 819 suicide awareness prevention and response, 822 automated. External defibrillator, AED, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, 823, naloxone, 824, maintaining professional adult student behaviors, 827, conflict of interest, 828, fraud, and 830, breach of computerized personal information.
I need a motion. So moved. I need a second. Discussion? There's no date as to when you're going to post them. When do they go? When do they get posted? Board votes tonight. They can be posted tomorrow. Tomorrow. And how can I get to see these? How can I get a copy of these? They're on board docs. How can I get a copy of these? I can physically print you off a copy or you can access them. There, I have no other way to see them. Thank you. So looking at them, I wish I had it. I got killed to have one of those. So looking at them from here, there are policies that are, we have a lot of policies that are very, very, very outdated. So going through all these 800s, that was several meetings. It wasn't just we read the room in one meeting. I mean, we've been, it's, we're trying to go through as many as we can because we're really back now. Any other discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Seven yes, two absent. Diversity and inclusivity training. Board is asked to approve the expenditure of $8,500 for district professional development on diversity and inclusion awareness training on March 26, 2021. So we have a problem. We voted to return to school on March 26th, and this training is scheduled for March 26th. And that's also going to preclude our construction date. So we need to decide what we want to do. Is it possible to change this flexible instruction day to the 25th? The 26th was the only day you're speaking to. Uh, Anita Wilson, that was the only day that she was available because she had a very active speaking engagement schedule. All staff, Mr. Mack? It is, everybody. And everyone's board, required. Board members would be also, that would be open for everybody. Are, are people re required to do it or is it? I'm, I'm, I'm requiring everyone to do it. Okay. Proposal and it says development session to the staff of South Carolina High School. No, it's, it, it's, it's open because I had talked to her. It was open for the entire district. Okay. We had to talk about this before there's a motion. Right. Well, I was just bringing up the date so we can make a motion in a second, but we have a problem with the date. So we're going to need to do something with this, or we're going to need to do something with the start of school. Okay. It was proposed to end on number 13 for the 26th to be a day. The board would allow that to occur. That would be the first day back. Problem is, that's the only available date that she has. And I really do think it would be very beneficial in speaking to her. She was, she was very articulate. I think it would be very beneficial for the district. And you're positive that's the only date she has? Yes. Personally, I'd like to be present for this and not, not even be present with it. That's what we're going to do. I mean, I don't have to be, um, but we, you know, we're trying to get this back in the school. And I think we've already made the decision to go back to school. I'm not sure that's.
can we um, make a motion to approve this? Um, and do we have to change the date possible? I, this is towards the end of last book. He was he was booked up for months out. Is this the only option we have for diversity training? It was uh Roberts. I think he is he's a local individual with like pretty good insight for well, our, our community. She is alumni, right? Yes. Which is is really good. She is um, well versed in this. She's very very qualified and she's professional in this area. And it's um, a training that the teachers brought to us, and it's something that they would really like. And I think it's really important. Um, I think that we could vote to approve it if we can find another date that works. If we cannot, we will come back to John. Yeah, I know that she was very, very limited on what her availability was. I, I had asked. I think it's messing. I, I, I do believe that we should have that as soon as possible. I mean, uh, so, Mr. Mansion, what do you suggest? What do you suggest? I think that it's very beneficial for our district to have this training. Uh, I obviously made a recommendation for a return. Uh, we could return. We could come back as, as a remote day on that day for flexible instruction. Kids would remain. Uh, they would be on, on a remote and we can bring We can have the professional day. I just don't like uh, the first day back would be not, <laughs> not really the first day back. When we're saying, hey, you're first day back to five days and stay at home. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just wish we had, uh, I didn't realize the dates of this when we were discussing it earlier. I wish it would have been brought to our attention when we were having that discussion. I didn't realize what the date was for this. And so, um, I mean, I do agree that the training is very important, but. I also, I don't know what to do about it. Shell, can I ask a question? And since we seem to be talking, yeah. who on this board has seen this presentation? Who has seen this? I have not seen this specific one. What? I have not seen this. Nobody has. Presented. Nobody has. We're going to spend eight thousand dollars, and we don't even know what this is. I believe that the teachers who brought this to us. Why have this seen one, Christy? Why this one? Why this one? Where did this come from? This is from Maryland. Can you, can you say she was an alumni of the school? She, she is yeah. an alumni. She is uh, a local individual that has- She's uh, the lady that posted the big long Facebook page about Southmoreland. Is this the same lady? No, I don't believe so. No. Now, wh how, how did you get this? Who, who, who- The union. The what? union brought that to us. Who? The union, the teacher's union, SEA brought that to us after discussion with her. So this board is gonna sit here and vote on something for $8,000 that none of you know anything about. Where did you see it on Facebook? Her posting, this is the same woman. Yeah. It may not be the same woman, but this is from Philadelphia. Is it from Philadelphia? No, Maryland. Maryland. No, this, this one's from Maryland. Okay, maybe the other one is from Philadelphia. Whatever. What? I just can't understand how you can do this. I, it's beyond me. I spoke to her for over half an hour. And she was very articulate. She, I think, she had some very a, a very good message that could be shared with this district and our our students and our parents, community teachers. I, I think she just had a very good message. And there's no one here who does this. You're kidding. No. Eight thousand dollars for a program we've never laid eyes on, heard, or anything. Eight thousand bucks. I actually, having researched it, I think it's very well worth the cost, especially given the amount of training we've given the teachers in the past, which is zero for this. I think that we're kind of making up for the last 15 years. I think it kind of spread it out over 15 years and consider it a deal. We have money to burn. Is it something we can do at the beginning of next year? Or so? 
I'm we sorry. do it at the beginning of next year's? I think we need it then. I mean, there's really no, there's not much time left if this lady's booked. I mean, let's yeah, wait and see what we can find out. I could try to push it out till next year, but I, I, I strongly encourage. Oh, I do too. But if, if she's that booked up, I mean, it's either do it, it's either do it on the 26th or do it next year. I still would advocate that we we really consider having this individual Bonita present to our district on the 26th. Can I ask? Maybe I can. we have some parents in the audience and some parents here. Do you think that going back to school full time on Friday is much different than going back on that Monday? Anybody? If instead of going back to 26, going back to 28, 29, 29, 29, 29. Well, Mr. Nash had a lot of reasons. I have reasons too. They're asking the third month leave. That's what we're asking for. So, yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're out of order now for speakers' comments. Okay, sorry. We need to make a change our motion for the return to school. So we need to decide what we want to do. Well, I mean, are we making it Monday the 22nd or Monday the 29th? So do I need a motion to, to, to change this? How do I? Motion to rescind. Are you going to vote, bring back the other one? We're going to have to because. We need, need a motion to rescind the previous motion so on I the need return a date. Motion to rescind the return to school motion. Mr. Cronin, does it have to be the person that made the, the individuals that made the motion? Do they have to be the ones to rescind it, or can we just rescind it? Um, uh, anyone can. Okay. Then I make that motion to be the previous motion. I'll second it. Welcome. Mrs. Kristen Smith? No. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Pike? No. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carried five yes, two no, two absent. I'd like to make a motion that we return to school on March 22nd. I second that. Roll well, discussion. March 22nd. Yes. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Carson. Yes. Dr. Pike. March 22nd, yes. Mr. Polakowski. Yes. Mrs. Raymond. Yes. Mrs. Rhodes. Yes. Mrs. Kristen Smith. Yes. Mrs. Williams. Yes. Motion carries, seven yes, two absent. I'd also like to make a motion that we can send these dates for when this will be open for people to change their minds because I want to make sure that we're giving building principals enough time to ready their building. Um, I think this should close maybe a day or two earlier than Friday um, so that we aren't pushed right up against the weekend. 
So I'd like to make a motion that this closes on the 17th of March. It will still open on the 12th and it will close on the 17th. That is the Google, Google form. form for people to decide whether they want to return to it fully in person or if they want to remain remote. I just don't think that closing this on the 19th makes sense if we're going to come back on the 27th. So that's my motion is to open it on the Google document on March 12th and to close it on March 17th. I'll second that. Discussion? So I thought it, I thought you couldn't make a motion as the president of the board when she stepped down or something like that. Somebody told me that. Down. We have done that, but for small bodies like this, I think that's an unnecessary. Oh, so you're just waving it, okay. I have questions. I, I mean, that's years ago. I'm, I'm remembering Al Stoker may rest. In peace. If somebody, if you don't want me to make the motion, Captain, if you'd like no, to. No, no. Somebody that. told me that you have to step down if you're the board president, you have to step down. And it's, you know, it's, it's the Robert Schulz order thing, Michelle. I don't care. I don't We're care. offering a modified. Rules. You're modified. They're, they're not the strict Robert Schulz. They're modified. Okay, so I need a motion. Did I have a second? I second it. Yeah. Um, any other discussion? Roll call. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Seven yes, two absent. I now need a motion on the diversity and inclusivity training that is scheduled for March 26th. I'll make a motion. You need a second? I'll second it. Any other discussion? We're paying $8,000 for a speaker for one day. That's and you don't even know what she's gonna say or what she has to do. You've never <laughs> laid eyes on her. I think, I think most of us researched. I still think there has to be somebody local that we know could at least interview. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Pike? No. Mr. Holokoski? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries six yes, one no, two absent. Flexible instruction teacher and service days. The board will be asked to consider the approval of proposed dates for flexible <laughs> instruction teacher and service days. These dates are March 26th, April 21st, and May 7th. And the purpose of these days are for teacher professional development, with K 5 utilizing the time for ELA specific professional development presented by FATAN consultants. At the secondary level, teachers will analyze alignment of current curriculum, the state standards, and identifying learning progressions and important concepts. And on the afternoon of March 26th, there will be a district-wide professional development session on diversity and inclusion awareness, which I would encourage everyone to participate in. Need a motion? I need a second. I have a second. Discussion? Who are Patan consultants? Who made the motion? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Nobel. This is from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Any other discussion? Just to clarify, these are days that will be school days, but they will not have live instruction. They will be at home doing work remotely. Yes, ma'am. Okay, just wanted to clarify for everyone. So again, those dates were March 26th, April 21st, and May 7th. Roll call. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Smith? Yes. 
Mr. Carson. Yes. Dr. Fife. Yes. Mr. Polakowski. Yes. Mrs. Raymond. Yes. Mrs. Williams. Yes. Motion carries. Seven yes. Two absent. We had an item um, added to our agenda for um, Mr. Steve Smithola to receive a job description and be added to the Act 93 contract. Um, did we have any comments on that? No, I did not have any comments. I need a motion. I'll make the motion. I need a second. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mr. Carson? Yes. Dr. Fike? Yes. Mr. Polakowski? Yes. Mrs. Raymond? Yes. Mrs. Rhodes? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Motion carries, seven yes, two absent. Citizens comments? I have none. I had a um, Jill Cedar, but uh, she didn't want to wait that late. Uh, she just wanted her kids back in school. So she's happy. Is there any other citizen comment from? Yes, please. What was that? I'm sorry. You want me to state my name again? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Nicole O'Rear again. Um, I live at 1155 Valley View Drive in Scottsdale. Um, I wanted to talk about something um, you all brought up about diversity in the whole training for teachers and stuff like that. Um, I personally, as, as a citizen, don't see why you can't spend $8,500 on, you know, having training for teachers when you're spending, I don't know how much he makes, but when he's on administrative leave and it's been several months now and we have nothing. There's no been no public apology from, I guess I'll say it from Richard Love. There's been nothing. Um, I guess some of you all have reached out to some parents that have, you know, biracial families and stuff, but we're all in this. We're all ticked. Why, why does he still get to keep his job? He admitted it. I mean, this makes no sense. Why is someone going to be able to spout out what he feels on a public forum as a teacher and still be on administrative leave getting paid for it? It's wrong. And you all have left this community in the dark about it. So I hope this training for $8,500, I hope it helps. Because you need it. I'm done. Mr. Bacconic, can you explain the process, please, that we're in the dark, no one wants to do anything on uh, Before a school district can have a uh, possible termination of an employee, there are specific procedures to be followed. And um, in specific, um, there has to be a under the contract, an advance notice uh, given to a member of the bargaining unit uh, prior to a louder mill hearing. Um, after that is accomplished, uh, if there is a decision that there is um, a basis to proceed, the case is then brought in the form of charges for the school board to then vote on at a public meeting. If that is done, that is done with a public vote. And there is a um, date scheduled for a potential hearing before the board. Uh, an affected employee who is a member of the bargaining unit has the right to either proceed under that procedure or to elect under the collective bargaining agreement to go to arbitration. Uh, so these procedures need to be followed. 
uh, the fact that uh, it was not dealt with tonight, by no means does that mean that it is uh, over. In fact, it is not. Gina Miller, 606 Arthur Avenue, Scottsdale. Every teacher signs a morality clause, correct? That clause was broken. This has to be the longest process in the history of this state right now. Racial comments have been said in multiple school districts throughout the United States and with days that individual fired because of the morality clause that they are obligated to sign. When you go to school for education, you take courses in college for this. We may be a predominantly white school district, but that is not an excuse at all. My children were disgusted at those comments. My son's best friend, who was biracial, cried when he saw those comments. I was sitting next to his mother at a wrestling match while she read those comments. Why do we not have any multiracial or biracial or black teachers in this district? Not one. So you know what? You spend that $8,500 for that training because every single one of you need it. These biracial children, these black children, these African-Americans, these Asian children in this district, they deserve better. Our children deserve better. He should have been fired. His morality clause was broken. This has to have been the longest process ever. And the community is outraged. The community is disgusted. And every single one of you on this board should be disgusted as well. I hope you all attend that training. I'll pay for it because every single one of you guys need it. I hope if teachers choose this early retirement option, I would like to see a black teacher hired. I would like to see an Asian teacher hired. How about a biracial teacher hired? Because our children deserve better than what has been given to them. Thank you. May I? Yeah. Uh, Jan Kiefer, uh, Homestead Avenue. Um, Richard Love is my neighbor, and Richard Love's gonna live here as long as he's wants to. Uh, I'd like to point out that we have a predominantly um, security force that is made up of people of color. I don't think this is the place to come up here and make the statements that were made at this podium about the process that we're going through here. And I want to remind people and, and the people in the back, I'm in, I'm in a biracial marriage. Uh, this isn't easy, but we have to understand that Richard Love didn't admit that he did anything wrong at this point that I'm aware of. Um, I think the community needs 
discourse on this, and I think that's going to come in time. But um, I want to be clear that um, I'm not commenting on the issues or issue with Richard Love. I'm commenting that as a person who's deeply affected by this, like everyone else, um, I want to say that right now, Richard Love does not need this kind of treatment. He may, uh, or I'm, I'm just going to stop right there. Are there any other comments? Need a motion to adjourn the voting meeting. Motion. We need a second. A second. Session. <coughs> Roll call. Or I guess just all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Is anybody opposed to a five Yeah. Mr. Carson? Here. Dr. Pike? Yes, here. Here, here, I'm sorry. Here. Mr. Palakoski? Here. Mrs. Raymond? Here. Mrs. Rose? Here. Mrs. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Williams? Here. Citizens comments. I have none at this time. January 2021 Treasurer's Report. The board, board will be asked to consider the approval of the January 2021 Treasurer's Report. Any discussion? February Fund Accounting Check Summary Register. Board will be asked to consider the approval of the February Fund Accounting Check Summary Registry. Any discussion? General Fund Board Summary Report as of February 28, 22. The board will be asked to approve the General Fund Board Summary Report as of February 28, 2021. Any discussion? Superintendent information. Yes, I'd like to uh, put a shout out to our sports teams, our winter sports teams. They were uh, very successful. Uh, girls basketball team obviously uh, went uh, fairly far in the playoffs. I also would like to recognize Henry Miller. Henry Miller is a swimmer for uh, South Moreland. Uh, Henry won the WPIAL gold in the 100 meter breaststroke and will be representing South Moreland at the PIAA swim meet. So Henry, thank you very much for uh, your, your hard work and your effort. And we're very proud of you. So good luck at the PIAA meet. Also at this time, I have uh, Mr. Novikov who will be doing the second part of this presentation here. I do believe this is where you need your... That's where we, that's where we need the... Is this... Okay. Uh, so like I, like I was discussing before, um, we're looking at outside requests for proposals for bids to compare it to what it would look like to hire Paris back. Um, so I got some notes and we'll walk through it. Um, Mr. Claire, can you go to the first slide? So paraprofessionals, including classroom assistants and personal care assistants, uh, they provide support to students, uh, predominantly those in our autistic support and life skills support classrooms. Um, that's not exclusively. Some districts have Title I classroom assistants. We used to have learning support classroom assistants, but at this point, that's kind of essentially what we have. As of 2019, paraprofessionals uh, are contracted through ESS and that two-year agreement. We have 19 current positions, two are currently vacant. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, though, I'm using the number of total positions as 20. That was the original budgeted amount or prepared amount last year. Uh, this year, we went to 19 because of need. Um, and just for the math of this, there's nothing to vote on, but just for the math, I, I am using 20. 
Um, the ESS agreement, we notified them in writing that we are not allowing it to automatically renew. So it expires June 30th uh, of this year. So Mr. Clara. So by the numbers, um, and I know you probably can't see that on the far right. Um, can't do anything about that. I don't have control. You can move that, Mr. Clara. Uh, ESS uh, pays at a rate of $12.50 an hour, seven hours a day, 183 days a year. So uh, that's $16,000 uh, that our paras make, but ESS is bill rate is $16.50. Uh, when you take out their federal and their different tax obligations, their profit is about $3.27 an hour, about 20% markup. So if a para worked all day, every day, 183 days, the profit ESS would turn is about $83,777 with a cost to the district of $422,730. Next slide, Mr. Clara. So some considerations to make. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Too far. Thank you. Uh, so there's no paid time off. District is not billed when there is no sub. Fiscally, that sounds great, but it's terribly programmatically and actually can result in a lot of serious issues when we have students, we may have to change the type of placement because we can't satisfactorily maintain para. So we actually don't pay when they don't have um, a paraprofessional there. Their recruitment, onboarding, and training is done by ESS, payrolls managed by ESS, and sub-management system is run by ESS. Of course, last board meeting, I was asked very directly, um, are all our positions staffed? No. Um, is payroll efficient and seamless? No. Um, and are we getting subs? No. So um, this is one of the reasons why we decided not to just automatically renew with ESS. This is part of the agreement, but not something that was um, satisfactorily being maintained. Next slide, please. So looking at what our uh, pairs used to uh, make, and I know I don't know if we can pull that, that window at all, but uh, on the top, you'll see what a paraprofessional's salary was with single healthcare and dental and vision. The cost to the district for single healthcare and vision was a total of about $26,000, a little 750, which is about $5,600 more than what an ESS contract would be. Moreover, down below, if a paraprofessional was electing family health care and dental and vision, that amount jumps to $38,858 or about $17,000 more than an ESS paraprofessional. So for today's, what I'm presenting to you is not that old agreement. Um, I don't think that with the fiscal constraints, that would be plausible um, or even probably considered. So if you go to the next slide, but when the district did employ paras, we had contributed to PEASERS, the Pennsylvania State Employees Retirement System. They had paid time off. Their pay was structured as a salary, much like mine or a teacher's where it's every other Friday, 26 equal pays. Um, and of course the district health benefits. So when we look at the cost and how much ESS is charging us and wanting to offer something better, and I'm looking at our restrictions, the health benefits are a big barrier. They really are, and I don't have a magic like solution to that. But we can address the other three, I think fairly reasonable. Um, so yeah, if you could go to the next, next slide. So what I would propose, and this is modeled after uh, uh, the IU's done something similar, is that we consider rehiring pairs at a rate of $16,200 a year. That number is $12.50 for a seven hour day for 185 days. The contribution to PEASERS, Social Security, Medicare, Unemployment and Workman's Compensation is calculated. $1,620 would be the hub who is the um, insurance broker, the recommended cost to qualify for an Affordable Care Act plan, the minimum insurance that we would have to offer. It has to be both uh, affordable, it has to meet the affordability rate. So we couldn't offer our other insurance as the primary because it wouldn't be in the affordable rate and it has to meet minimum requirements. So Hub, our brokers said use 10% as a figure. So I used 10%, they came back today with the breakdown 
and it is almost spot on. It's almost exactly that. That's what it would be to meet the requirement. So a paraprofessional who opted into the single payer coverage that we legally would be have to offer to not be subject to Affordable Care Act penalty, uh, the district's obligation would be $1,620 a year. Every paraprofessional who chose not to have that insurance, we would not pay. So it would come right back off the top. Um, candidly, this offers benefit. Insurance is not good still. I won't lie about it. I'm not gonna pull any punches. It has high deductibles. It is not something that is great. It is unfortunate that that's the circumstance, but I think I showed in the previous slide, huge barriers to that quality of insurance. What it does offer though, contribution back to teasers and paid time off. The biggest issue I have, I think almost ethically is that we need a paid time off system. In the middle of a pandemic, our paraprofessionals who work hand over hand with students who very often can't wear a mask, lose money when they don't come to work. They are literally incentivized to come to work sick during a pandemic. Um, I don't think we thought about it that way then. And I don't want to like, but you know, it passed it, but, but we've really learned that, wow, that's not good. And from an ethical, I think, standpoint, no matter who, pre pre what presentation we get, no matter who it is, or if it's this, I personally don't want to recommend anything that doesn't include some paid time off. It just, it, it's, it's the bare minimum I think that we can do. This is five days. It is not a lot, but it's five days that our parents may not have to come in sick um, and, and, and risk other people's health. I use the calculation for that paid time off is $17 per hour. That is what ESS was getting ready to go to. So we were at $16.50 with ESS. Our contract had a 3% increase at the end of this year, which would be $17. There's very likely that if we wanted to manage our own subs, that number could be lower. Also, subs are very hard to get for Paris. So if a sub wasn't used, that money also wouldn't be spent. Um, as to whether that would carry over or how it could be used, that it's a little premature. I think we'd have to definitely unpack that more. Um, you could go to the next slide. So the difference though, on a 20 pair of professional positions, considering that ESS is gonna increase by 3%, and I can tell you with some level of confidence that ESS being the large corporation they are, are going to have some of the most, uh, the lowest rates. Um, there may be people close, but no one's really gonna get much lower than them. This is what the numbers would look like. About $7,500 difference <laughs> and more money to us as the school district to offer what I just proposed over what ESS was getting ready to offer next year. That includes five paid time off days and that includes contribution to PEASERS. That also includes autonomy. Um, one of the things that, to be honest, if you look at the numbers, if we really wanted to dedicate ourselves to a 3% pay increase, that's a budgeting item for next year of $12,000 if we thought that, that was really important. If we wanted to rediscuss insurance later on and how we could offer options to buy in, we're not tied into a contract that says for two years you have exclusivity and I can't do anything. And that's what happened kind of with ESS. We, were, we couldn't third party it out even when they couldn't fill a position. So I think that also looking at this, remember ESS, if they don't fill a position, that number goes down. Fiscally, that sounds maybe good, but programmatically and for our kids, it's terrible. Every time a pair wouldn't take insurance though, that South Moreland number also goes down. So that 7,500 is made up by five paras who went on their spouse's insurance when we went to ESS who don't wanna come back to this insurance, that number is now gone. So, it, so in the grand scheme of 400 plus thousand, nearly half a million dollars, this is sort of in the um, you know, standard error of measurement, uh, to, so to speak, as far as where it's at. Um, and because I, I just want to be honest, the ESS number will be lower, but for the worst reasons possible, for the worst reasons possible. Whereas South Moreland's number could get lower, but they'd still be gainfully employed. You know, ESS's number only goes lower when we can't service our kids. Next uh, slide, last slide there, Clara. So some considerations. Uh, so ESS costs, assumes a full work year with no absences. Again, that number is based on 183 days. They never miss a day. They never miss an hour, uh, which isn't really practical. But again, maybe not for the best reasons. Uh, each employee declining uh, South Moreland insurance would save the district $1,620. PPO time uh, is based on a third party provider. So that number could even be lower. If it's a lower number, you could maybe include more days. Uh, South Moreland School District employed parents would require administrative management. So there is work to be done by the district. 
I, they will let you in on a secret. We're doing it a lot of it now. I'm recruiting pairs right now and calling pairs and I'm calling for subs right now. And we are basically a middleman for ESS at this point. So it's not a huge change. Also, when we outsource paras, we never furloughed any administrative secretarial staff. So the people who were managing it two years ago still work in the district. So there are existing systems. It's not like somebody left the district. Uh, Southmoreland School District employed para that salary averages $12.50 per hour, like I said. And one of those reasons is because uh, I was talking to Mr. Rodriguez in, in the business office, uh, the, the payroll, she's, the, you know, tomorrow the most important person in the district for all of us who work there, right? And she was, I was, she was walking me through that if we wanted to do a personal care uh, home assistant to send into the home and have a higher rate and within the normal working hours, it really is as simple as a supplemental worksheet like we would have for extended day tutoring that would be approved by me, signed by Mr. Masha, and then that rate increase would be added to the salary. Um, speaking with paras, they're not a monolith, they're not all speaking as one, but I've talked to many. Um, they all almost universally say they would much rather 26 pays that they can exactly expect what they're getting than the hourly rate. At ESS, if we have two Act 80 days that throws off their pay calendar or some snow days when we used to have those, it totally can disrupt their pay, even if ESS was paying on time and perfectly, it would disrupt that and it would go up and back and forth. Here, there's 26 equal pays that they, they see throughout the year. And um, they would also have the teacher's holidays without having to worry about it affecting their pay. They would have the benefits of that schedule that teachers have without it affecting their pay. Um, last, Mr. Clara. I, I honestly, I, uh, last slide, I really just wanted to put my email and my number up there because I really, um, you know, uh, I'm not a businessman and I wanna, I've vetted the numbers and I called Hub and I've looked at the, the percentages and I wanna make sure we're flushing every, every concern out because um, it, it, I just, I do think we maybe can't offer, could you go to the last slide? I don't, I think maybe we can offer, can't offer everything, right? But, but we can offer better. And, um, you know, we've retained almost half the paras that we have stayed with us since we switched to ESS. About four or five more came to us from connections to the district. Our paras are very connected here, very loyal. Um, um, I personally think there's, there's some dignity to, to having them be with us. Um, I think our teachers treat them very well. I think our administrators do. We have a deep amount of respect and appreciation. So um, I think this would be a way to not cause financial harm to the district and improve programs and services. So if there's any questions um, and for the public, I have it up there too. That's my email and my number and of oh, Dr. Pike. Alex, I just have two questions. Sure. Um, who hires the subs? Who, who, who did subs belong to? So there, you can contract a third party subs. That's yeah. like some of the people are gonna make a proposal. So we would have to either come to an agreement or we'd have to do it internally. When we had our own, we used ESS for subs. Was, um, but we have, we'd have to make that decision. Do we wanna use them for subs? What are you recommending though? What would you do if you had the choice? I would, I would probably for sub service, try to have a third party that we would you use. That's party. why I picked that higher rate because if we wanted to hire our own, we could say, well, we'll only pay a minimum wage and then you can budget lower. I would pick a higher budget rate so that I could go with either, you know, Keystone Education Consulting or AOT or, or ESS again to be our sub provider. Now, I'm not putting you on the spot, but do you use a lot of subs for, for, the, for these positions? No, I, I have like one, I have, I have a phenomenal sub, um, okay, Ms. Cameron, and she's that. like the only one um, because there's, there's, it's hard to find subs. It's just, a, it's one that's really, so what we wind up doing very often is kind of juggling and pulling a classroom assistant to be a PCA. So we already kind of have to do this, but that's, yeah, we don't have a lot of luck getting subs. It's very good. I have one more question, Alex, sure. and, and I am not advocating for this, please. Could you do one or two less aids or do you have to have the full 20? So we looked at, at that because one of the first things I did was run the numbers if we went to that family benefit side and what if we only hired some. Um, it's just such an unpredictable thing. Right now at 19, we're really looking at a number where we're appropriately staffed classroom assistants and PCAs. Two kiddos move in with PCAs and you, and you, and you break it. So I, I really, I would say 19 is where I'm comfortable right now. I, I've looked at maybe going down, but we went down from 20 
Remember, we went down from 20 last year, and I said 18, and then I kind of came back and said, please forgive me, can I have 19? And we said 19, not that we've gotten it yet, but so we said 19, um, it's going to float in that area. It's, it's Well, like sometimes when a new student comes in, we have to adjust things, you know that. Mm -hmm. um, nothing is carved in stone whenever you have to deal with the needs of these children. Yeah, but as if, if he comes in with a PCA, we need to start with the PCA and then maybe say, oh, does he or does he not? Like we, we run into that all the time. The kid transfers in. PCAs and the IEP is a related service. It's an obligation. And it might take us a week to go, yeah, I don't know what they were doing down there, but this kid doesn't need a PCA, but we have to start with the PCA in place because it's in yeah, there. But it doesn't sound like the sub thing is a big problem to you. <laughs> no, it's 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 it's, it's, one, it's it's in public ed right now, whether it's teachers or paras, it's just subs or just something that's in, it's just a tough, tough, tough situation. It's not something that I would actually be the make or break as far as decision making. There's not a good solution I have to getting subs it's 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 tough it's really really tough especially for parents it was when we had them employed full time it was it was very tough to ever get um a sub but i do feel very strongly we got to incorporate paid time off i mean we just we saw it this year we we literally incentivized people to come in sick because i mean it hurts your paycheck you you, you can't you know alex thank you for showing us this because this is a big question that i had about this issue and, and I, I mean, I think over the coming weeks, that's why I asked Mr. Master to do it as soon as possible because um, there's more questions I'm sure to be answered. And I, I definitely look forward to doing that. Any other questions? Anybody have any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Solicitor information. Um, I have nothing to add to what we've already discussed tonight. Business manager information. Or information. We can't see Western Psychiatric Hospital Service Agreement. The board will be asked to consider the approval of an agreement between UPMC Western Psychiatric Hospital and South Warner School District for student services. This is something that we've always done in the past. Okay. What would some what would some of the things be events that we would be getting from them? If there is a service agreement attached there, uh, like for this would be. Vince, for what it's worth, I worked with these people for many years in terms of their student services. I know I, I was in charge. We had, sadly, student, su student suicides, and they had teams that came out on a scale one to 10. They were a 50. I mean, these were really top-notch people. Yeah. This is um, a pretty special service that they offer. If the student is hmm? enrolled, if the student is enrolled in that service, that's usually a, a great need for that individual to have. In certain cases, they'll come out to the schools. You know, they have teams that, to provide services. They're, they were amazing, amazing, knowledgeable, skilled people, high quality. Is there any other discussion? Group estimates for the primary center. The board will be asked to consider the approval of an estimate for the repair of the roof at the primary center in Alberton in Mr. Basham. You have anything that you could add? There's a section of the roof on SPC. I do believe it is over the audit uh, stage area. It is of great concern, and I think Mr. Bash can expound on that. Yeah, that's the the stage area. Uh, has a, a rubber sprayed on roof. And uh, the outside coatings compromised, and we're getting a lot of a lot of water being held in between the layers of the roof. Uh, and it, you know, it's it's eventually going to end up inside the building. Um, there's a couple of different ways that companies propose to take care of the work. The first the first company I had come in is uh, Conklin Roof Spec excuse me, specialist. And that is the style of roof that's on there now. And what he proposed to do is basically drain that roof and go over top of the existing material that's there. 
I really don't think that you can get all that water out of that roof without leaving behind some type of moisture to go over top of that and just, you know, trapping it inside there. Next two companies are very similar in the scope of what they wanted to do. More money, but I think it is the better way to go. They would tear off the whole way down to the concrete of the old roof, the old tar, tar and gravel roof, re-insulate. Um, and when they insulate, the insulation is very rigid and they would make sure that uh, it was raised on one end higher than the other. So it would, the water would feed down into a drain. Right now it's not running to the drain at all. Then they would cover that with either a mechanically uh, held down rubber roof it's a rubber membrane. It has seams. Uh, it was mechanically and, you know, like adhesive applied, whatever it would take to hold that down. And I, I do think that is a much better repair just for the simple fact that you open it up and you know you're getting all the water out of it. There is another section of roof that's a little bit larger. And the coating on that's wore through now. You can, you know, I can see it when I'm on the roof. We have pictures of it. If we let that go much longer, it's going to end up retaining water also. And there's two ways to go with that. If you go over top of it now with the Conklin while it's still dry, the sprayed on rubber roof, it's a lot less expensive, but he can get away at this point with power washing or pressure washing it and just redoing the overcoat without tearing anything off because right now we don't have any issue with it retaining water so i mean i, I it's you know it will be up to you guys is the amount of money that we have to put into it but i would definitely say we need to tear off that the stage roof just to make sure we get everything in there dried out so if we go over 21,300 though, we have to get into the formal bidding process. Does insurance cover any of this? Did you say 25,000, David? 21,300. 21,000. Okay, these both go over that. At least that's what they have written here. Yeah, I believe the only one that's under is uh, no tear off and re insulate and respray over top of the existing material. That will be the one that will be under. Um, the first one from Tom was that um, redoing, like spraying over the stage and half period, both. No, there's two separate two separate prices there. The stage is uh, twelve thousand three hundred and thirty-six dollars. Then the cafeteria area that I had mentioned would be the seven thousand five hundred and fifty-two dollars. There's, you know, there's less work there. He don't have to drain that. He has to pressure wash that and respray. And there, you know, there's no re-insulating there or anything. Where if he drains it, he's going to have to re-insulate and make sure that that water, you know, heads towards the drain. So if we were to go with one of these other bids, um, like from Legend, we would be looking at this twenty-four thousand plus. 7,000 from Coughlin. Now this, that may change. That 7,000 bucks that he quoted may for the increase. other section was being that he was already there, his equipment was already there. That was the price to do it while he was there. When's the last yeah. time we had this roof done? Uh, the most of the roof, there are some patches up there that are a little bit newer. Most of the roof is 14 years old. There was money in the budget this year to do some repair work on that roof. We were never done over the summer last year. Um, we ended up with a situation a few weeks ago where that roof did leak 
in Carlisle. Um, there was, if I'm not mistaken, there was some kind of rigged up system to catch water. Um, it's it is a you know it is a purchased system you know it's something that's meant to do what it was doing what it was doing it, it for did some fail. reason that overflow correct correct it did fill now that that leak has been repaired the, okay. you know the Conklin guy did come out and he did find where it was getting in the building at he did seal that up okay So basically, no matter what we would do at this point, it's probably going to need to be fixed, right? Because we're looking at at least 24 plus to repair the other portion. So you really need to decide what, what kind of repair do you want done to arrive at the specification? Do you mean, do we want to tear it off or do we want to Mr. Basham, what do you what do you suggest? Me, I I don't know that you can get all the water out of there without tearing it. Okay. I'm I'm not confident that you can you know drain and get all the moisture out of that old roof without a tear. -off. I think that makes the most sense. You know, I mean the, the the guy from Conklin was pretty confident that he could do it and do it very well. But I just I don't understand, and I don't see how you would get all that moisture out of there without opening it up. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Polkowski, is this something you want to meet in committee with maybe Mr. Basham and discuss before we decide how we want to fit? Yeah. I don't know what our next meeting is. I have a question for Dave. I mean, um, how do we get specifications for this? Other than like have a gecko come out and say, hey, this is what you need, and then put that out for, I, for a bit. You know, that's that's the problem I have with these kinds of things. Um, I mean, if you want to go and hire a different engineer, um, not necessarily that you have to go to them, you know, but somebody needs to tell us, and I, I don't know whether or not Mr. Basham feels comfortable doing that, exactly everything we need. Well, the problem is, you know, there's three different companies looked at the roof, but they're all doing three different things. Three different things, exactly. So to get that. It, it almost seems to me that you need a, you know, somebody who's independent of that process as an engineer to go and look at that and say, well, Okay, here's your problem, and the way to fix it is this way rather than what one of these people are proposing. It, it may be the same as one of them, or it may be even something different. Well, isn't it true that when we put something out for bid, we already have to give them the specifications? We tell right. them what to bid exactly. on, right? Yeah. So they would all come in on the same page, exactly, because here you're getting, you know. So it's his Apples, question is who, who does those specs? Is that what you're saying? Exactly, yes. Who, who is going to say what, what that job should entail? We, we don't know. They, they, don't know. they don't come for free and tell us that, do they? Is there something that no. says that these companies can't come in, look at it, tell us what they think, like they just did, and give us an offer? I, I'm having trouble hearing the first couple of words with the echo in here. Is there something that says these companies can't just come in, take a look at it, like they've already done, say, this is what I would propose, and this is my bid for that job, and we look at the companies and pick which one we want to do, like kind of like we already did? You have to be, you have to be careful bid, so we don't get into a situation like three. the copy machine. It, it seems to me that you have to have a common platform. Yeah, that, that's the problem because the, uh, the specifications of the job, you know, somebody's using four inches of something and this other company's using two inches. Exactly. And there's area you all. Well, who would you go to to get these specifications? 
probably an engineer or an architect. Could I think it could be an engineer. So would we have to advertise to hire an engineer? No. Okay. So we would need a motion next week to hire someone to give us to develop the specifications. specifications. Yes. Are you okay with that, Mr. Falkowski? Yeah, I mean it's that the I don't, I don't know the, you know, about this or the, the links. Mr. Mitzvah had a, you know, I know it was in the budget for a magic palm spraying spring or stuff on it. So, you know, I don't. Do you know how much was in the budget? Or talk to Eccles. Problem is it didn't get out. I was asking him how much is in the budget for this item. Then you're then you're possibly getting into the realm of prevailing wage act. Like you know yeah. 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 It was twenty eight thousand eight hundred fifty dollars was the quote that the company gave last year, but we were to go with Conklin's to just just to throw it out there, like I'm not saying this is the way we should go, but to do both of those things through Conklin is $19,788, which is under that $21,000 threshold. But yeah, you still need uh, three quotes for that exact work. You can put the under 21. Yes. Yes, the. Uh, the law is very specific on that. Uh, you would need three uh, documented quotes uh, if the cost of, of that work is between $11,500 and the bid threshold of $21,300. So between eleven five and twenty one three, you need uh, three documented quotes. If it's $11,500 and less, you don't need to get quotes at all, but it's always good to get quotes. And so these three things don't count as quotes because they're different things. They're not official yet. You have to you have to develop a standard of what you want done. Um, but yeah. it appears we have no choice but to go in that direction. We, we either do it or we don't. I mean, if we're going to fix the roof, we have to get the specs. Yes. Do you have any objection to using our existing architectural firm? Who is that? Eccles. Eccles. They do school buildings. When you put on new roofs, when you, you uh, redo old roofs. Can we um, just let Mr. Polakowski discuss this with Mr. Bash, maybe since he's the head of the committee, and then come with a recommendation or give it to Mr. Mash to put on the agenda for next week to vote on? Yeah, to put tackles on? Yeah. Somebody else? Yeah, that seems to be the consensus. And Do we make we're just talking about stuff we don't know about. Next, we'll have to make it next week. We're out of time. <laughs> Yeah, this is not a voting meeting. Correct. So it'll be next. Is there any other discussion? Standardized testing next fall. Well, I'm sorry to say that uh, since this was published, uh, the PDE put out the guidelines and the tests need to be returned to them by September 30th. Of next uh, fall, there are five days that are allotted for ELA, four days for math. As much as uh, it's going to pay me, uh, I, I really would hope that the state would have put on these uh, the testing windows. But uh, I, I can't see how we would be returning and our kids would immediately go into testing situation, which is not it's not advantageous for them. Uh, right now, currently, the ELA uh, testing window is April 19th through the 23rd. The math testing window is April 26th through the 30th. And the optional math in the science window and makeups is May 3rd, May 3rd through the 7th. 
uh, DRC gets really particular if their tests aren't returned to them before the uh, stated deadline. So we'd be really, really pushing being able to facilitate this. I hate to come back and have uh, students come into full time and test, but I, I, I just don't think it's advantageous to bring them back and then miss the first month testing. I think both of these options are terrible. But there's not a there's yeah. not a good win on this one at all. No, I think the good win would have been really bad to, Didn't we just vote on one of those days being a uh, yeah, virtual day to stack the ballot in phase? I think would be April nineteenth day. What are you recommending, Vince? Page seven. What are you recommending? I I would recommend that we take the as much as it pains me. I think that we need to take the, the test. During the uh, spring, here. what if we opt? Can we opt out? Do you think so? Nope. Public schools cannot opt out, but parents can. Yes. <laughs> it's we didn't hear you. Do you want to do the tests in September or at the end of this year? I think, looking at circumstances, we should do them at the end of this year. Okay. Okay. So this this motion will not be on as it says there, right? This, this will change, right? And you're going at the end. I have a couple questions about that. Um, do all the cyber schools do their own testing? Yes. Well, if that's what you call it. And I think PA Cyber is not doing theirs until September. Do we get a copy of the results for our kids? I think they have to publish their results. Yes. Do you think they publish individual procedures? No, I, they I just really don't that. Score. Yeah, yeah they, they're not allowed to publish individual state. Well, but I mean, even to us, because those kids reside in South Florida. But that doesn't really matter, right? Once they're gone, they're not ours anymore, no. so we have no right to anything. Right, right. Okay, okay, so we don't know how they're doing. We don't know how they're doing. Okay. So you, how does that can... work if we have kids that are coming back to the district? It's an it's an ugly situation what, no matter what, what. What have the teachers said about this? How do they feel these would be administered best this spring or waiting until September? Oh, uh, we this just changed. We just got the notification this week about the thirtieth. So I really have not had a chance to discuss this with the teachers. I think that would be important to know. They probably have a better um, gauge of how the kids are doing and what they can handle at this time. I feel like partially my. My gut reaction is, I feel like everything about this year has been a wash. So why don't we just do the tests and be done with them and be over with them so that you can come back in the fall and just have all that behind us. I also think doing them in the spring is also a terrible idea because we've already missed so much instruction that it's been take time away to do tests is not good either. But I do kind of not like the idea of having to do them as soon as you come back to school. Like, I feel like that's not great either. And also then you like, Lost everything over the summer. Like, I don't know. I don't. I, like, There's always yeah. retention problems over the summer. So we're bringing kids back. It already might be disadvantaged or, or having learning loss because of a certain situation. Then we're putting them in a testing situation. Right. I mean, it's I, a stressful situation no matter what. It's we're bringing kids back. We're stressing them by testing them. We bring them back in the, in the fall. We stress them by testing them. This, this is just a terrible situation. I, I just don't understand why. The state would be so set against, set against, or, or set for having these. Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel like the spring probably is, like I said, just get them done this year, be done with it, and then you know, in the fall, just have all that behind you. It's kind of hard to feel about it. That's just my. Hopefully, in the fall, we can resume somewhat of a more. I hate to use the word normal because it's overused, but it would be really nice if we can bring kids back under a little bit more normal situations and, and actually have school. Yeah. Do we have a problem with those dates because one of those flexible instruction days would be May 7th, which would be the last day for when you said May 7th? That's makeup. I think we can. any other discussion? ESY extended school year. The board will be asked to consider the approval of the job description and dates with extended school year program ESY. And that uh, is attached. That's something that we have been 
every year practice isn't anything extra. Well, we impact students participate in ESY that we're looking at. Sean had an inquiry from a, a person. Is there any consideration for regular students to have summer school? We are exploring options right now for what it would take to get students. Thank you. Thank you. Is Thank there you. any way we can join forces with other districts? We can we can look into that. Mr. Mr. Novikoff, are you aware of any other districts right now that are extensively looking at ESY programs? I'm talking about yeah. summer school. Yeah. Okay. There are districts that do offer credit recovery. Uh, I think we need to seriously look at what we can do as a district to help our students. Definitely. That needs to start with nine weeks. There was a program that we were told about that was supposed to be during the month of March of uh, February, I believe that um, kind of uh, assessing, I believe it was on the website, each school building. That's the, uh, it was with, the testing, oh, yeah. have you finished that? No, we were told about it at a board meeting. Um, you were gonna take the month of February to, geez. I thought it was to look at the kids' progress and see the ones that needed a little more help. Nobody? Testing or? We're looking at uh, doing some kind of remediation programming for our students. Failure recovery plan. Yes, thank you. I thought that was supposed to happen during the month of February. So was that something that happened? Yes. So did we have for the throughout the buildings a lot of participation with that? Uh, Okay, what about the other buildings? Because I know we were given a list of every all the classes that were being because we're failing. I don't see the high school. In here. I know Dan's up in the pop up first. He's over there in the far left. No, the other, the oh. other Dan, Dr. Claire. Thank you. Yeah. In participation, I suspect. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. That's when students were given the opportunity to do make up work, whatever right. was, was remiss. Right. They had that month. Yes. Okay. So do we no. see any classes that they're not failing now? Is there a big difference? I'm, I'm sorry. Is there a big difference? I can't. It's okay. <laughs> Just let's move on. Do kids do solo during the summer? Between the reverb and uh -huh. mask, I'm, I'm sorry. Is there um, E Academy for the summer? Do they operate a program? For credit recovery. Um, any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Kindergarten kickoff. The board will be asked to consider the approval April 17th as kindergarten kickoff. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. 
that date, um, Mr. Claire could answer, but it's not that that's going to be in May as a kindergarten screening, not the kindergarten kickoff in April. I didn't, sorry, Mr. Mash, I didn't realize that date was still on there. Mr. Ma uh, Claire had sent that out earlier, but it's going to be in May um, as a kindergarten screening. So that's uh, our fault or my fault. So um, I apologize. Thank you. If you'll get that date for us for the next meeting. Yeah, there was some conflict with though we're opening schools up wanting to bring people in. So the typical kickoff we couldn't quite do, but doing screening in May was something. Um, so I didn't know that date was still there. So I apologize. Thank you. Any other discussion about that? And Mr. Krofchek to talk about high school spring activities. Good evening. I, I thought I would take this opportunity now uh, in March to talk about the three big spring activities. Can you get a little closer to the mic? I'm sorry. I can't hear it. To talk about the spring, Thanks. the three big spring activities here at the high school, uh, the musical, the prom, and graduation. Uh, I will talk about the first one, which typically is what the administration has uh, full charge of, and that's commencement. Uh, our plan for the commencement of 21 on June 4th is to have it at the stadium uh, right now commit to an outdoor commencement. Um, it has been uh, a wish of, for several years to have an outdoor commencement, but in the time of COVID, uh, even more important, it would uh, drastically increase our capacity uh, to have an outdoor commencement. Uh, as it stands now under the current guideline, and we're, and again, everything we talk about here with the exception of the musical, and, I'm, and Mrs. Gore graciously came to discuss that more specifically, uh, is within the framework of the guidelines that we have today on March uh, 11. Um, as of today, we can have 700 people uh, on top of the, the number of participants on the field. So that would amount to five tickets per graduate if it were to happen as of today. Uh, we're hoping obviously that that increases, uh, but it's still actually uh, a, a pretty large number of um, people uh, to be allowed in the ceremony. Um, we will have in our, our, our seeking rain dates for Saturday the 5th, and I would even put out, and this was suggested to me by some colleagues and other districts to do outdoor commencements, to also have that Sunday as a rain date so that we can try to avoid rain as much as possible. Uh, I would argue that by Sunday, if it rained three solid days, we just stand in the rain and um, try not to prolong it uh, as it's already within the week. So hopefully we can get it within those three days. Um, so that's commencement. There was some information that went out about prom today, and I wanted to clarify a couple of things. This is our base plan. Our main commitment, because we did lose the prom last year, is to absolutely ensure that we can have a prom. And our base commitment at this point is that at minimum, we will have it and can have it on our grounds uh, with the rental of wedding style um, outdoor tents as well as catering. Uh, as a base minimum. That way we can ensure the kids have an opportunity to have a prom in the event. The original facility that we booked last year and rolled over to this year will not allow more than 75 participants. So there are a lot of hard discussions that have to be made. So we came up with a base plan to assure that we can get as many students as possible we also initially started off with just juniors and seniors. We never allow freshmen to prom. Uh, that was about a five year practice that we have not allowed. Uh, and I know there may be some discussion from sophomores uh, wanting to attend the prom, but we wanna first start with minimally the juniors and seniors and see what kind of numbers. If we have 300 some people, we might be hard pressed to, to get more in the capacity requirements that we do have. We are seeking outside venues because the, the, the frank reality, and there may be a, an example here and there, well, so-and-so is doing it here and so-and-so is doing it there. There's two frank realities about it. One, 
indoor venues right now are at a premium because everybody's wedding was canceled last year. We also have a Saturday prom. And that means that most weddings are on Saturdays. Most proms are actually on Fridays. And uh, we opted to go with a Saturday uh, prom several years ago uh, so that we didn't miss another day of instruction. That being said, it, it's hard to book the facilities and they have caps. So the caveat that's not often discussed in, in kind of the discussions among people that so-and-so is doing this and so-and-so is doing that. Well, they may be only allowing their seniors to go and they may only have a hundred seniors go. We, two things, I always subscribe and when we do this with the yearbook, we do this with the prom to keep prices affordable for as many kids as possible. We put a range out today. Earlier it was says $75. That, that is our ceiling. We don't want to go over 75. In order to go outside the facilities, and if we do have to venture off the school property, we're going to have to probably seek a higher price for the students. So we said 50 to 75, and hopefully we can find something that's probably going to have to be an outdoor venue. Uh, where we use tents, no matter where it is. There are a couple examples that we're looking into, but if we have it here, we want to keep it 50 to 75. We have not fundraised in a year at Southmoreland High School. Um, so we don't have the money to start with like we did in previous years either. So there, there are all these factors put into place. We are also at this point limiting outside guests. And I think that's been actually what some colleagues around the IU have talked about. I think contact tracing, I think liability issues become a concern when you have students from other facilities in the midst of the pandemic. To, uh, that's the primary reason why we're saying outside guests. So it's not that we're not allowing guests. You can bring in guests. It's that we're, we're seeking to limit outside that guests for that reason. Um, that in a, it kind of in a nutshell is, is commencement and prom. And I guess before I bring Mrs. Gore up to talk about the musical, are there any questions from the board regarding those two activities? Mr. Kravchuk, if they lift the capacity at the stadium, how many tickets would students be able to have then? Like we were at max capacity. Max now. capacity, we could probably do seven or eight a piece. Dan, probably. Not. Yeah, you could probably yeah you could probably do 10, 15 a piece. When we have it here, I think the most I've ever given out has been eight. So I would say if we lift capacity or it's changed, we'll have at least the minimum of what we've been allowed to do. Thank you. Yes. Do you have a date for the prom? Right now, our tentative date is May twenty second. We will, the Grand March will be on the, at the stadium on the field like we did homecoming. If it rains, we, we, this is obviously our capacity in here right now. Uh, we would have to just have the participants and live stream it. Um, if not, we can have, we're saying two guests per person right now, just to start at the base. I don't want to promise big numbers and then have to roll them back for the Grand March. And Mrs. Gore, she's so graciously waited to discuss something she loves to talk about, music. And if you've been to some of her concerts, you know, she talks about it for quite some times. She knows that I get more nervous about public speaking than I do about conducting a three-hour musical. So um, thank you all for having me here tonight. Um, I've been at Southmoreland for 15 years, and just four short years ago, we took the big step at starting a music theater program. Thank you, Mr. Kravchak, for inviting me here tonight to tell you about our big plans for this year. So um, before I do that, I did want to mention, uh, make note of some of the musical staff that you'll see later on your agenda. Um, we're hoping to bring back a very small group just to help with all of the safety precautions we've set in place. The director would be returning. Uh, his name is Mr. Sean Conway. If you've never met him, he's a great guy. He's our director, our vocal coach, and really a creative genius. Our choreographer, and this year she'll also serve in the role of assistant vocal coach with Miss Kaylee Hansberry. 
Our artistic director and costume is Ms. costumer is Ms. Chelsea Forbes. Our set architect extraordinaire is Mr. Larry Ansel. And I would like to return as the producer, music director, and program and website manager. This year, we would like to bring to the stage Les Miserables in, in a different capacity than we have before. Obviously, this year has been filled with trials and changes, and we weren't sure we were going to have a musical production. We weren't sure because I couldn't, I wanted to make sure I could stand behind a plan that I shared with you all that I would feel safe bringing my own children into, let alone your children and those in the community. So I'd like to share a little bit about the different plan that we have um, kind of in the works and see what you think about it. Um, as Mr. Krafchick alluded to, I'm a big talker and I promise I'd keep it to five minutes. So um, I did make a really nice little presentation. If you wanna check it out, I put it on our website, southmorelandmusical.net. If you're in it, for the, uh, in it to win it for the full details, there's a 22 minute video that goes over the safety plan and all of the justifications for the decisions. Uh, there's also a nine minute Cliff Notes version if you're Mr. Krafchick. Um, but uh, I did wanna tell you this year's production, we're looking at doing a concert style production through scheduled content. So those are two sets of words that have gained a lot of popularity in music theater this year. So a concert style production focuses mainly on the music of the, and the, the um, stage presence of the students. There is a lot less blocking. Uh, that's a, a theater term for how you stage people and how they move around on the stage. So there's significantly less blocking staging and choreography, but it does allow us to bring a couple of new elements to our stage. We would like to rent digital projections, uh, animated projections in the background, and it would be the students would be performing predominantly face front. So you bring the soloist to the front of the stage. Now, if you do go on that website um, and check out the video, Mr. Conway did a fantastic explanation, um, and he also showed a, shared a clip what we would love to model our production after. So if you want to actually see Les Miserables in a concert style production, there's a ton of them out there. It is one of the best musicals to do in that style. So you can jump on there and see it for a couple of seconds if you'd like to. The other wording I threw out was scheduled content. Scheduled content means that we will, we will film in different uh, timeframes with different groups of students and through the art of videography, so something else that would be new to us. Um, we would master one final production and we would schedule timeframes where that would be released to the community to view from their homes. Um, we realize some people may do small watch parties and things like that. So we, instead of just doing one to promote smaller groupings, we were looking at potentially three dates to, to stream it. So those are two very, very different ideas. Um, the idea of scheduled content has picked up a lot over the last year, obviously, because of the pandemic. A lot of concerts that were conducted this summer were done in that manner. You bought a ticket and you would have your small group of family and friends there to share it with them. Now, the safety protocols. And I have, obviously, 22 minutes to talk to you about with that, so I'm going to keep it to 45 seconds. Um, <laughs> the uh, masking and social distancing will be would be top notch. Our kids have been so good. If you walk into the music department up here, you'd see that they have been fantastic with cleaning, um, social distancing. They're great about using practice spaces. So we're actually pretty well versed in that already, but we will continue that on the stage. Um, cleaning procedures. We talk to them about not even just cleaning the space after they leave, but when they get there. So the spaces that we would be looking at using and would provide a list to our custodial staff when we're there would be for larger ensemble rehearsals in here so we can socially distance. We have use of the band and choir room for smaller groups, 10, 15 kids, use of the library. And then another huge benefit we did gain by moving the production schedule back is the safest place to rehearse is outside. So we do have, we obviously have use to that too. Um, a couple other things uh, with the schedule, the uh, concert style presentation is very much uh, in line with NAFME and PMEA guidelines. NAFME is our National Association for, PM, uh, for Music Education and PMEA is our Pennsylvania Music Educators Association. If you, if you followed the aerosol studies at all this year, they are, there's a lot to, to read into for vocal and instrumental music. Concert style presentation and rehearsal orientation, us being able to sing and project forward instead of at each other in acting um, is significantly helps to reduce that risk. So that was a huge reason for the concert style presentation as well. Um, location and air exchange. Um, that is something that I try to do in my room a lot. I realize with instrumental music, um, we have to worry about aerosols. So we make sure that when we can, we aerate the space in between performances. And I try to stick to the 30 to 40 minutes max of rehearsal at a time before we aerate and move spaces. 
and things like that. So I'm blessed to have outside doors and we're lucky in here that we can aerate a little bit and uh, try to move the students around. So we have that in place and in plan. Uh, the last two other big things, um, we're limiting staff. We know that we're taking on the biggest musical that South Merlin has done, though in a different format, which makes it manageable with a significantly smaller staff. Um, and then just as an added, an added bonus, and it's all personal choice, and I didn't care that I shared this, but we're all either vaccinated or trying to get vaccinated uh, to share that with the students. So they're, they're on that. Um, and then the last component, which has been the hardest one for me to, to, to work through is I love having the pit orchestra. And that was, that was a really hard thing for me to know that for what I felt was safest, I had to give that up. So, and there, and I can go into tons of detail why, uh, it all has to do with the aerosol studies and Les Mis or any other um, musical has a, a pretty extensive pit. And if you've been here before, the space is already maxed out with a regular normal size pit. Um, but then there's scheduling and issues with how can we get the music ready? If we can have 30 minute rehearsals, this way, what we're going to do is we're going to rent broad, Broadway quality accompaniments. They come from our production, excuse me, our production company, and the kids get them right away. So if a kid does have to quarantine, they can have that music at home with them. Um, if we have to have any kind of closures or anything, we can work through Zoom with those accompaniments and the students can be best prepared. So, the, and like I said, there's a lot of other justification for the no pit too, but I, I am proud to say that almost every kid who was in the pit um, last year and the year before have decided to either try out on stage or to be a part of the leadership team. So that was an opportunity too, educational opportunity for kids who may be music teachers someday uh, to kind of stretch their wings in an area outside of maybe their comfort zone now. So in conclusion, on behalf of myself, the students and our entire musical staff and booster organization, we wanted to say thank you for preserving the opportunity for our students to share a fantastic performance with our community. We hope that you also share that enthusiasm for the endeavor. With a year that was filled with trials, we are hopeful that this could maybe be one of the culminating highlights of the year, not only for those students, but our district. We are confident in our plan and our devoted efforts to keep not only our students and staff safe, but our extended family throughout the entire community. As always, we are open to discussing any ideas that you have that help promote the health and well being of our students and encourage any of you to reach out at any time. We look forward to the opportunity to share our 2021 production with all of our community and to share the, the perseverance of the young ladies and gentlemen in our music program. We can't wait to share their talent, passion, and education with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did anyone have any questions? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say to you that um, last year, Suzical was like the last fun thing I did with my kids before the whole world got shut down. And it was an amazing production. I've been to all your productions and they've been so amazing. So I definitely look forward to what you guys are going to come up with for this year. Thank you so much. I know we, we were one of the districts that were very lucky to get our production in. So that very next week could have been a different story. So we were blessed for that. Um, and I, I hope that you and your, your kids enjoy the next one too. Thank you. Not the, uh, we have a world-class music department in this school district. And I, I know that it's, this board has always been very supportive and uh, Mrs. Gore uh, does a phenomenal job. And I just wanted to make sure that, that I went on record here today to, to just say and give recognition to that program. So thank you for your time. Thank you. The board will be asked to consider the approval of an agreement between West, Westmoreland County Behavioral Health Developments Developmental Services, Westmoreland Drug and Alcohol Commission, Inc., Single County Authority, and Southmoreland School District to provide SAP coordinator through St. Vincent's College Prevention Projects from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Any discussion? Fund balance? Proceeds from the sale of the Rustdale building is $150,000. The board will be asked to consider which type of fund balance they wish to use for these proceeds other than unassigned fund balance. The choices are as follows. Non-spendable fund balance, unusual to use for this purpose. Restricted fund balance, unusual to use for this purpose. 
committed fund balance, very common to use as it would be committed capital improvement projects that has the highest level of decision-making authority resting with the board. An assigned fund balance, very common to use also with less restrictions on potential use. The board will be asked to determine how that money will be assigned. Is there any discussion? So I'm confused. I thought when we got that money, it was absolutely earmarked for capital improvements, no? I thought so too. I, I thought that a sale of a property had to be go. That's what we were told at least. You have to uh, decide which category of fund balance you would like to put it in. In addition to, in addition to it being capital. Well, we know that it's going to be used for capital. But so you're doing both. Yes. So it doesn't matter which one you put it in. It's just it's limited to. You, you, you got your choice. I mean, if, if you if you go to the the committed, then you you have to state specifically you're committing it for let's say uh, roof project. If you want to be less restrictive, you just want to say we want to put it towards capital improvements, then you would assign it. In the assigned fund balance. Yes. Well, that makes sense. Because exactly. it's 150000 we're not going to put that yes. in the roof. I'm it's, it, it's, not, it's not enough money to, to put into a... Uh, so really, the assigned fund, fund balance is really the only choice. Yeah, I think that's the best choice. Yeah, okay. Can Thank this you. money go towards fixing things like the tennis courts, resurfacing the track? Yeah. It's, 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 it won't be enough to do all that, but yes. Whenever you put it in the committed fund balance, when do you have to say, hey, I need this for parking lot? Well, you, 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 would, you would make a formal resolution. We are committing X dollars for this specific purpose. Okay. So uh, we're going to put towards parking lots or a roof project or whatever. If, if you want to be less restrictive in your motion, you say we want to assign it for capital improvement period. projects, period. So, you know, you have 150,000, it could go towards the, the roof, which you know, might be 25, 30,000, whatever. Uh, you could put uh, another 25, 30,000 towards uh, repaving or sealing, things like that. You know, that's what it's going to be used for. But much like years ago, you committed a certain amount of fund balance for ERIP payment, and that's all it could be used for, unless the board wanted to change that commitment formally. Mr. Paul Costi, I'm going to be speaking with Mr. Basham and possibly having access come in to do something with that group. Obviously, if we have to bid anything over $21,000, the tennis courts will have to be bid. Is it possible that we have somebody look at both of those situations at the same time versus calling Eccles in here two times to give us that? That's what I wrote down. I know that um, the tennis courts are going to be they did, the, yes, they were. So you could have a, a moving company that's post our group, and they just give you a bid and you could go with it? Uh, probably. I don't know if roofing contractors are part of the CoStars program. Okay. That's but but that's, that's, that's easy enough to check on. Yes. There are other programs that uh, construction capital improvement projects are, uh, are in. Uh, the National Joint Purchasing Association has a, a lot of uh, contractors that uh, pre, uh, I don't want to use the term bid, but, but pre-price uh, their work. For example, uh, we had one of those companies come out uh, back in uh, 2014 to look at the Scotty Way uh, project. And they gave us an estimate which told us, well, we're going to be in a bidding category. So uh, in the board back then said, well, we want to bid. We don't want to just go with one of these purchasing uh, consortiums. Is there any other discussion? Adoption of intermediate unit policies. The board will be asked to consider the approval, the adoption of the Westmoreland intermediate unit policies and procedures on the federal requirements of 34 CFR Part 300. Any discussion? Twenty 
2021-2022 share SAP liaison. The board will be asked to consider the approval of the agreement for a shared SAP liaison for the 2021-2022 school year as we have done in the past and there is no cost to this. Any discussion? It's a shared SAP liaison. What's a share? Share. We would share it with another district. If we designated one for our, our district, it would cost $25,000. $25,000, I saw if that. We, so we you, we're still, decided, this will be $12,500. No, it's, if we decide that we are not we're sharing, there's no cost. You're going to share or not? I believe we should share it. Yeah. Okay, so that's twelve thousand five hundred. No. <laughs> no fee. No. No fee. No fee. Oh, it's free. Okay, that's great. Is there any other discussion? Personnel maintenance position. The board will be asked to authorize the administration to post and subsequently advertise if no internal candidates for the position of district maintenance worker. Any discussion? FMLA for MS 2021. The board will be asked to approve an FMLA middle school teacher, MS 2021, number 01, using sick leave and a personal day from approximately April 19th, 2021 until May 17th, 2021, and using parental leave with no break in service or benefits from approximately May 18th, 2021 to the end of the 2020-2021 school year. Any discussion? Advertisement of the head and assistant boys soccer coach. The board will be asked to authorize the administration to advertise for the positions of middle school head boys soccer coach and middle school boys assistant soccer coach. Positions have already been posted with no response. Any discussion? 2021 musical staff. The board will be asked to consider the approval of the following 2021 musical staff. And I do believe Ms. Gordon might have just added one student, so I will make an update that before. Okay. Does anybody have anything else before we take citizens' comments? Are you asking for citizens' comments? Well, I asked if anybody had anything else before. Michelle, we... I will be very quick. Uh, it's getting late, but um, there are three things I need to talk about. I have heard many people in the community make the statement, our teachers are not being paid. Is that true? Mm -hmm. That should be corrected then. I think the public needs to know that the teachers are being paid. I've heard that pretty often. Yeah, we Apparently people are under the impression that we're not paying our teachers. My belief is that everybody in this district is getting paid with the exception to possibly um, some issues that we have with an ESS situation where they were not paid in a timely manner. Everybody else, to my knowledge, is being paid and we are in negotiations with the teachers. But I want the public to know that our teachers are being All paid. Employees are being paid. No one's having to pay with them. The second thing I'd like to clarify a comment that I made later, I said we're spending $8,500 for one day of diversity training. It's $8,500 for one and one half hours of diversity training. One and one half hours of diversity training, $8,500. But the last thing I wanna talk about, and it's not something that I've heard discussed very often. The last time that our students took achievement test scores were in the spring of 2019. The results of those test scores were never presented to the board or to the public. And I have some very serious concerns about some things that I've heard. Now, the reason that I'm asking about this is it, I think it's important because by my calculations, 80% of the kids who took those tests are still students in our schools. The board is responsible to establish and approve a curriculum. And I have a sincere concern about that matter. Everything is important. 
on, on uh, that's related to the school. But to me, nothing is more important than, and, than educational quality. I'm really concerned about the curriculum, the situation that we have with curriculum and have had in Southmoreland for a long time. I, I have a book here and I'm sure that most of you, maybe you never heard of it or never saw it, but it's called, it's by a woman named Charlotte Eiserbite, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. And my concern is what is happening to our students. Public education is getting a really bad rap across the nation. And I don't want it to, I don't want South Moreland to have that, that problem. I don't want that. So I'm asking the board to really pay close attention to allowing, uh, approving as much money as we have to, to buy the appropriate curriculum. The appropriate curriculum is what we feel that the students in South Moreland should have. That's not necessarily the same as Philadelphia or, or Pittsburgh or New York or anything else. But I'm very, very concerned that we are not getting the results of those tests. I think we need to see them because if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. I would again ask that this be, be uh, distributed, this information be put out there. Uh, uh, I know that you, you think, well, we'll just put it on the internet. There are a lot of people out there who don't have a computer. I'm not the only one, believe me, I'm not the only one. We've always had presentations about our, our achievement testing. I would like to see that. I would like to see a focus on our curriculum and our educational program. I am concerned about what is happening to our kids. Thank you. Is there anything else? I think um, Mrs. Carson handed out the superintendent evaluation. Um, those will be to do back at the next meeting. Thank you, Citizen Thompson. I'm aware. Need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Thank you.